Yep. Uh, today is uh, Tuesday, May 13th. This is a posted meeting of the Board of Public Works. Uh, we have three board members here. We do not have a quorum, so this will not be an official board meeting, but we're going to conduct the meeting content uh, regardless, and it will be recorded. All right, I guess I'll get it kicked off. I know um, for those who haven't met me before, I guess two or three here. Um, I'm Dave Peterson, Kleinfelder. Um, I'm the project management pro project manager for the CWMP. Um, my expertise is collection system um, planning, design, and then on treatment plants. I, I'm not a really deep process guy, but I do. I've done a lot of stuff on headworks and you know grit and more of the uh, non biological type of things. So. Um, I've, I've got a broad background, um, I think, in a lot of ways, water things. So um, that's kind of my background for those who I haven't been exposed to yet. Um, and Pam, you want to introduce yourself real quick? And sure. Um, I'm Pam Westgate, and I've been primarily working on the wastewater treatment section, so the CWMP. Um, I have a process background and biology background, so that's my. my background and strengths and I did some of my graduate work at the Northampton Wastewater. Sure, you know. I did. <laughs> and I guess I reckon Gary, I remember I, you've been to a few of these meetings, so um, I know you've got the background on how we got to where we are now, I believe. So somewhat. <laughs> somewhat. Um, as I said in previous meetings, repetition is good. Yeah. Um, it's nice to go through it again and again and yep. um, so I'm a member of the board. Yep. And uh, I've been on this, um, I guess, subcommittee. Yep. Sort. Yep. I know David Shear, you've been here for a few of these as well. So, mm -hmm. and I know that we were very much in the abstract in previous meetings talking about some of these alternatives without, you know, idea of cost or anything like that. So that's kind of what this, you know, task nine was try to put a put you know put some boundaries around these alternatives and see what we're talking about. So we can definitely talk about the, that aspect of things now. Um, so that's, that's good, and then and then Mike, I know I, I believe you've been involved. I I've seen you in these BPW right. meetings with us, but right. uh, I've been involved on the periphery. Yeah, so it'd be good to have your your input and same same as everybody else. So, um, so did you guys meet Diane Rossini? Just briefly, the, just briefly as as she sat down. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So Diane is in the engineering division um, for six months. <laughs> okay. So you know all about her. Oh, we're allowed to know. I'm sure there's more. I'm sure there's more. Okay. And then John indicated that Whatever. I think Friday he's going to be on vacation, and then and Jim sort of taking over super. So so we kind of got that informally, uh, you know, sort of before we started here. So I think we're I think we're up. To speed. Um, so we're here for you know up to noon, and you know if, if we run out of steam, we could we could just stop whenever you want. <laughs> but um, we're I'm expecting here to be to be a noon. Um, these meetings, um, you know, take some time. There's a lot of obviously a lot to cover. The task nine study, which is the main objective of, of our discussion, you know, was was pretty in depth. Um, I think we looked at I don't even know how many alternatives I've never, I've never encountered them. We had like 25 separate deficiencies that we we're looking out for. It's four, so I know if you have maybe three on average or four on average, maybe we had about 100 alternatives that we priced out and evaluated in the Task 9 study. Um, obviously, the collection system, I think we had 10 different projects that we looked at, and the treatment plan, about 15 projects. And I think what I want to do is go, is go through the plant first. Uh, just because we have, you know, Pam, John, and Jim are all here from the plant. Um, I think optimistically we'll get to the collection system, but if we don't, that's fine. We can push that off. Um, and just kind of broad-based objectives. I mean, for, for me personally, I want to be comfortable that, that everybody in the room understands, you know, what we're recommending, you know, what the nature of the project is that we're recommending and the costs. And if if there's any discomfort with any of it, you know, we can get into as much detail or as little detail as you need to to feel comfortable. Um, as a, a recorded meeting and a, and a public meeting, I mean, this is part of um, the public engagement process that any CWP needs to go through that's being funded by DEP. Um, so this is something that um, we take, you know, very seriously, which is why this is the fifth time I think we're getting together as a group here. So um, making sure that everybody's on the same on the same page moving forward. 
I think that spells out the objectives. Does anybody have um, anything that they want to cover that I haven't talked about or anything like that? Just I can write that down. Okay. I, I think the one thing that that's sort of in the front of our minds as we look at this is um, we don't have sixty-three million dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, everybody knows that. So the question is, um, how do we prioritize? this wide range of projects, recognizing that there's some real financial constraints as to yep. what we can accomplish. Yep. So you probably hear a lot of questions along those lines as okay. we go through this. Yeah, and I I mean, Pam and I will, will readily confess, you know, at this point in the process, you know, we've only developed, you know, the projects and the costs and prioritization would be part of the, the task coming up. Mm -hmm. um, but it's never too early to start talking about that and with everybody in the room, I mean, to get your, your first impressions, I think is gonna be very valuable. So I absolutely, we can talk about that as we're going through it. Um, we, uh, we spoke with Dave yesterday a little bit to debrief him about the board meeting last week and some of the things we talked about so we could get a sense of the thoughts that you had and the things that we had discussed. We just, I think, gave him a little lead in to what to expect today in terms of our discussion of of cost and so he's really not as psychic as he might appear. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> well, this is the first time where cost has been an issue, so I, I wasn't anticipating that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Um, so I just for I just did want to back up real quick. Um, I didn't put together a fancy PowerPoint this time around, but I just um, this is a slide from a from a previous PowerPoint. I don't know if you need it or not, but basically. Um, yeah. It just kind of schematically puts out sort of the CWP process and what um, I think what, what Kleinfeld has done in the past um, in terms of you know what's worked for assessing conditions and then moving into sort of the the recommendation and, and development phase. Of CWP. Um, so what we kind of broke this down into well, I guess I broke it down into two phases. Phase one is sort of the you know gather existing information, start some preliminary evaluations. So task one was sorry. task one was just kind of reviewing existing conditions, kind of getting us up to speed as to the collection system, treatment plant, what's going on. Um, future flows and loadings was looking into the future. You know, what's your population projecting to be? Um, how much potential capacity is there to, to grow? You know, how big can these collection system flows get? And that dovetailed with task three, which was doing um, sort of a, an on-site wastewater needs assessment. So how, what's the performance of your septic systems? Um, is there a really an environmental need for driving any, any expansion of the collection system? Task four was kind of a standard um, II study. That was actually the first thing out of the gate of this process back in 2011. Um, and um, task five, based on a lot of the previous information, you know, gathering GIS, gathering flows in the II study, we built a computer hydraulic model and we're able to run the, the spine under um, a variety of um, build out scenarios and different um, flow um, type scenarios, like inflow and, and II type scenarios. Uh, task six was uh, the treatment plan assessment. So Pam uh, got highly involved in that with um, looking at condition of existing equipment um, looking at how much life you might have left on some of these things, and then also looking at from a process side, um, how well do we need a permit, how well is the, is the system performing, what are the big issues on the horizon, what are the big issues today. So that was documented in task six. Task seven, um, I, on one of our prior meetings, we spent a bit of time talking about this in more detail, but um, risk-based asset management is something that I think a lot of these um, these types of studies are getting into where you're basically looking at if you're looking at your wastewater uh, collection system and your plant as, as an asset. So an individual pipe might be an asset, an individual process of your plant might be an asset. And you kind of ask yourselves, so two things, what is the probability of this asset failing or, or not meeting what its intended design was? And the second is what happens if it doesn't meet that? So what's the consequence if that were to occur? And the product of those two things generates what we call like a risk value. And risk ranges from zero to 10. And um, 
we really, after some discussion, decided to apply this only to the collection system because the, the plant is a, is a little is a little tough to fit it into a kind of a quantitative metric like that. The plant just requires a little bit more, I think, intuition and art form than, than the collection system does. So when you talk about prioritization of projects, this risk base, um, these metrics that we developed for the collection system are going to come back into play when we talk about prioritization of, of the collection system projects. For the treatment plant, um, we, we still kind of talk about risk in the same way, you know, consequence of failure, probability of failure. We just don't really have a zero to 10, you know, metric on it, but we definitely are going to be talking in those terms, you know, when, when we talk about each of those processes. Do you want to add anything to that, Pam, or anything on the plant? Um, and I would just say as part of task six, this is the wastewater treatment plant assessment, we did prioritize um, um, the projects and the needs that we found in the plant. So we've done some of this work already. It's just going to be a matter of putting the task six work together with what we've done now and, and moving forward from there. Yeah. So that, so collectively this phase one, we, we say defining the needs of the, the system, the wastewater collection and treatment plant system. And all of those needs kind of get shoved into this two-step alternatives analysis. So task eight, we call that like a screening level analysis. So um, at that point, it's sort of like any any idea is safe. You know, it's anything that's you know out of thinking out of the box, something wacky, something that you know ultimately wouldn't be affordable. You know, those were all sort of thrown into the mix and, and discussed and considered. And we used a I call it like a consumer reports um, type approach where you have like you know this is highly advantageous for this reason or it's highly disadvantageous for this reason. And we sort of had this more qualitative approach to screening these these ideas. And really what it was was just to get all of our thoughts on the table and then try to narrow it down to a more manageable size of alternatives that then we would put through a more rigorous um, analysis and um, cost estimating approach. So that's what task nine was, was really distilling things down into something that you know had a more legitimate chance of being a good idea and then looking at costs and, and looking at um, the actual evaluation of it, and that's that's what we're here to really talk about is is the result of that effort. Um, so the remaining four items, kind of going left to right, are sort of the follow up stuff. So task ten is something that um, you know for for DEP we need to do on any one of these these projects, which is environmental assessment. So of the recommended capital projects, um, what what are the envir potential environmental impacts, you know, of the construction and the, the long-term impacts? So, I think they're probably mostly concerned about um, if we were going to be recommending, like, building out Northampton sewer system to its full extent, what's that going to mean for, um, you know, groundwater impacts, water quality, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I'm just going to go out on a, on a limb without really thinking about this too much, but I don't think the projects that we have in the book are going to be that big of a environmental concern, a lot of it's right away work, a lot of it's within the confines of the treatment plant, things like that. So I, obviously the, and we have to go through the steps, we got to look at the MEPA triggers, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and that kind of can be done, I think, in parallel to probably task 11, which task 11 is, is where we start developing the capital improvement plan, the implementation plan for all of these projects. And this is where we really start getting to, into prioritization, um, affordability, you know, looking at you know how much um, you know the how much debt you're paying off now from from capital projects if there's any availability of debt dropping off in the future and then you know where do we situate these projects on a you know, five ten twenty year plan or do some of them fall off totally I mean maybe maybe we talk this through and and not all these projects you know go on there so um, so I, I suspect that there's going to be a, quite a bit of um, you know interaction between you know Kleinfelder and, and and you guys, you know, throughout the development of Task 11, which I think, I don't think it would be a good result if, if there wasn't, so. Dave, we talked yesterday a little bit. You don't mind if I interrupt you? Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, that's good, because I'll do it anyway. Yeah, I have to, <laughs> yeah. Um, yesterday when we talked, um, I had mentioned that in the, in the board meeting last week, one of the things that we started to do was to look at the way that projects were grouped. Yeah. So they were grouped, so talking about the plant, right? And, and maybe it would have been good if we had chatted a little bit yesterday, but we didn't, so. Um, we talked about the way projects were grouped at the treatment plant and that um, some of those projects could actually be, so they might have been grouped like secondary treatment related or sludge processing related, but when you drill down to the, the projects and the scenarios as they were defined in here, 
we might actually want to break them apart as part of a capital plan. Mm -hmm. And you can see that some part of one of these scenarios m might be a higher priority for us than another part. Mm -hmm. So sort of def defining how mm -hmm. those projects might be um, broken apart, I guess, in the yeah. future, either either as part of the CIP as part of this project, or ultimately when we when we go to implement recommendations in the document, we may look at affordability and deciding what what we can afford to do now, and what if some some portion of a scenario can be broken up and done later. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that um, we talked about yesterday on the phone was that, and we and we didn't actually do this in the in the board meeting last week, and that is. You've made recommendations in here and they're carried in the board executive summary up front and we went through that cost table last week, but um, Dave made a good point that um, you didn't always recommend the low cost alternative for any of these um, problem areas. And that was a that was a really good comment because I always go back to, to Terry's comment about the Bradford Street pump station where yeah. he felt on some level that maybe the wrong project was built up there. Now we love the pump station, it's been great. But it was, you know, it wasn't, it, when you compare the new pump station to what existed, Terry was always sort of left wondering, is there a project that could have accomplished the need but not have, not be that project that was at that cost? Right. So this basic question, right, of you have a problem, what are the different ways to solve it? And then Dave in the call yesterday mentioned, well, we had some alternatives that were that were lesser amounts of money, but they were ruled out for other reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I suggested that it might be good today um, to maybe look at some of the ones that were less expensive that were not recommended being moved forward, and, and we could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Because cost is going to be such a huge thing for us that um, you know, understanding what the options are, and you know, we're already talking about breaking things apart. And you know, yeah. Yep, exactly. And as we go through some of these items and, and there's we find opportunities to break some of these projects apart, it'd be good to actually identify that and you know, I'll write it down. <laughs> we'll try to make sure that we keep a you know, a good note of that because um, as I was starting to refresh my mind on some of these things, um, I did see some opportunities for that, Jim. I, I when we were on the phone yesterday I was like I think the hydraulic bottleneck one was the only one that I thought was a group one, but then when I started going through things I was like, No, oh, I can see how this could be broken up or whatever so um, but definitely we can look for opportunities like that. Um, and then obviously task 12 would be the COMP preparation. So I don't know if um, in terms of another big gathering like this down the road, I, I think maybe somewhere in task 11 we'll probably find a reason why we want to get together again. But um, at least getting to the point of having you know a draft plan together or some you know sketched out ideas of a draft plan, I think we'll probably work that or phone and, and you know Jim and Ned and, mm -hmm. and John and, and Jim, but then probably looking to pull everyone together again for at that stage, you know whatever the right time is. So, um, so that's sort of the concept or the I guess how the whole CMP is laid out past <coughs> present future. Um, and I kind of did this for everyone for benefit of people who, have, who haven't been exposed to this particular thing yet. But um, are there any questions on on that? Okay. Um, yes. I might just leave this up here. I don't really have. Well, I well, let's see. I guess the next thing is we wanted to go into the actual board memo, specifically table E5, which I think is what you guys kind of went through last week. Mm -hmm. So it should be pretty, we should be fairly familiar with it. But to us, this seemed like the best place to actually start the conversation as to what the recommendations are. And then we have, um, we obviously have the full report, which has all all the nitty gritty detail. I'm hoping that we can limit use of that just because I think it'll we might get sidetracked quite a bit if we get into those de that level of detail. Um, but if we have to, we have to. We also have um, Pam provided um, Appendix 6 from the report basically is sort of a, a comprehensive uh, table of all the alternatives that we looked at and all the costs. And the reason why I wanted to have this available was what Jim was pointing out was, you know, in some cases we aren't recommending the cheapest alternative. It's in the appendix, but it might be easier to have. Yeah, and that'll that'll help to point that out. But we'll we'll make sure that we highlight those. I kind of have a separate list of what those ones are. Um, so I don't know, Pam. Do you want to do you want to run us through table E5, starting with the plant? Yeah. 
or skipping the collection system traveling by. And if anybody wants a bigger mm -hmm. picture of the plant. Oh, I love that picture of the plant. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have extras, I'll take them. Really? <laughs> well, this one actually has what our recommendations are. Is, it? is that not like the one in the book? It is in the, it is in the, it's the one in the back. They're not folded. Look how nice, Gary. You're going to want a couple extras. <laughs> yeah, well. Turn around. Okay. <laughs> so, this right. is um, obviously intended to be very interactive. So, I mean, I think if. Uh, I suspect some of these are going to be kind of black and white, and there won't be much discussion about them, if any. And some of them might be a lot of discussion about. So, feel free to. Uh, interrupt Pam and, and myself when we'll see some of these. So, um, so as we get started on the first one, um, one of the questions that we spent some time, a little time talking about last week was the, um, the assumed 35 MGD peak flow and, yeah. and where that comes from and, and uh, whether or not you have any sense on whether that's a conservative number so that if we design for it, we're not likely to exceed it, or is it risky or some opinion on it? Because we know it's not a real number. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All we know is that the flow goes above 22, but we don't know to what right. level, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer that, or do you want to... Well, I'll, I can start, and then you can back up. Um, it's obviously a conservative number and actually the number we originally started with from the model was 38 yeah or, so but we knocked it down thinking that you know obviously some of the work in the collection system could account for some so of so this yeah. number came out of your your sewer system model yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. 38 was the instantaneous peak and then 35 was if you did a rolling hourly average basically so it's sort of the theoretical hourly peak basically from 35 mm -hmm. um, and is it tied to a storm event because we, we have inflow? Yes. Um, what was that tied to? I think that was tied to the two year storm event. Yeah. Which would be about, what, three inches of rain in that ballpark? Something. So, not even a substantial storm event. So, I, I agree with Pam that it's probably conservative. Um, and what I, I think what we talked with Jim about yesterday on the phone and what Pam and I kind of talked about is that we'd rather start conservatively and and make it smaller in the future rather than the other way around. You know, it's just easier to start bigger than you think you need and then pair back. and then pair back with get, getting actual information, you know, at some point in the near future. We got pretty close to actually installing a couple temporary meters this spring um, to like right at the plant to see if we can capture an actual flow. Um, and that's something that is still, I think, probably on the back burner for future future years. But I mean, I wouldn't be too comfortable committing to uh, you know a final design or anything like that without actually getting that number more specifically known, I guess. But that's what we're starting with now. We may want to do that metering next spring. Yeah, I and think. We talked about yep. that a little bit with the board. And yep, yep. We didn't pull the trigger on that on that contract for the flow metering. Right. But it would be really good information to have. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, I agree. Can I have that extra? <coughs> Okay, so looking at the wet weather, um, yes, we used the higher conservative number of 35. <coughs> we know that the 22 is too small. So whatever that upper number is, it's going to be higher than 22 MGD as is currently going through the plant. Um, <coughs> so of the options that we looked at, it looked like, um, you know, we did end up um, recommending the cheapest alternative, which was expanding the hydraulic capacity of the facility, which had a number of subparts to that. And I guess my question for you now is how much detail do you want to go into? Do you, do you buy into the one that we recommended? How much do you have questions about the different scenarios? What, what kind of questions do you have? What do you want to hear from me as far as each of the, this option at this point? No, go ahead. I, I have a comment. Go ahead. Uh, I think it would help to describe the basic, the, describe the recommended option. Okay. 
at, in just sort of in general terms to refresh my memory about what we're talking about. Okay. And, um, and then only if, I suspect only if it, you didn't pick the low cost option would we want to talk about Go into more detail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <coughs> so I don't know how the others do. Is that covered? Did you have another question? <coughs> All right, so for expanding the hydraulic capacity of the facility uh, now, um, that would involve um, changing the, the flume at the going into the primary treatment. So it's between um, the headworks facility and the primary treatment clarifiers. Um, and so if you, if you look on the figure, it's right near the parking lot. Oh, you see some cars to the bottom left. Right above that is the infl where the influent flow meter is. Um, so we would replace the influent flow meter. <coughs> and Dave, remind me, is that the one with the, the two, the one in front and one in the end? And in terms of the, the sensors or the modules? Yeah, which flow meter? <coughs> the flow meter is the ultrasonic sitting up above. Yeah. Yeah, one of the recommendations was to put a like a pre and a post to get a little bit finer tuning yeah. on it, but that was the one that wouldn't really affect the hydraulics through there. Right. Okay. We talked about upstream measurements at one point. I don't know where we are on that question. Um, in terms of um, like a temporary to get the to understand the peak flow or what do you mean probably a permanent a, a cheaper way to get a measurement so yes absolutely yeah, yeah I mean we can have um, we talked with flow assessment over the winter and they identified two locations where they would drop like a temporary meter in mm -hmm. and you basically would just be renting the meter for some duration until you get um, the kind of a you know a inflow event from a storm that you think would elicit what might be a yeah. relatively high peak. So we're probably looking for something like a you know two inch storm. If you could do a whole you could meet it for ten weeks and never see that. So it's you know, <coughs> you kinda you know, metering is always a little tricky. We actually got kinda lucky in our I, I studied and got two point four inches in one one storm. Um, but that's what we'd be looking at doing, you know. So is in that rate. effect would you be sort of calibrating your model to um I wouldn't necessarily offer that, you know, right out of the bat, right out of the gate. I just don't. I have to think about what that would ripple into. You know, I mean, I don't know if we just attenuate the whole model, you know, to match that peak or or what. I think it's a, if I was going to be doing the entire model again, I would almost consider a wider metering program. Yeah, you need more. You need more metering points. Yeah. You have to do more calibration work. Yeah, I would hesitate to change the whole model on the basis of one point of meter at the plant. So, but, um, but, but I think at some point, you if you if we're out there for 10 weeks and we get a one inch storm event, yeah. can, we can go into the model and say, well, the model would predict a certain inflow at the point mm -hmm. for a one inch storm event, but we actually measured a different number and mm -hmm. it's 80%. Right, mm -hmm. right. So then, so then what do you do? Do you, do you then apply the 80% to your 35 or? I would almost. I mean, I would almost separate the two from each other, where the temporary metering is really just for treatment plant, yeah. look, you know, looking at projects at the plant, whereas I, don't, I wouldn't even necessarily look at recalibrating the model on the basis of that one point. I think that might be a little dangerous. Um, but I, again, I think the only reason why we're talking about that is because we're concerned about the cost of the plant alternatives sure. and, you know, really questioning is that, are these the right numbers to be designed around? I guess another way to ask it is what what work do we have to do to come up with a, a basis of design for peak flow that that we're comfortable with? Mm -hmm. And that's that's sort of our challenge. Mm -hmm. It is, mm -hmm. and that it's important because this when I look at the this is a this is like a tough scenario to start because looking at right yeah. because all this scenario is about is getting more water hydraulically through the plant. Mm -hmm. That's all it is, right? So it. It's the uh, intermediate pumps, it's the influent flume, it's the effluent pumps, and basically just sizing everything of, of adequate size to pass 35 MGD. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't actually know whether that that's the number. Mm -hmm. So the concept of looking at 4.6 million to deal with wet weather capacity um, is like a head scratcher, like not the first thing that, that I would want to do. Mm -hmm. And then in the meeting last week, I think we, we were talking to, to John and Jim about 
well, what, what actually, so what, what are the repercussions of a, of a, a large storm event now, and, mm -hmm. and what are the bad things that could happen? Mm -hmm. And we talked about those a little bit. Um, so it's a tough, it, it's a little bit of a tough thing to look at, but I think Mike's question really cuts to the heart of it, which is, how do we get, yeah, how do, how do we get the number and figure out what we need to do? Right. And it's, it's almost like an iterative thing, to, just to add a little layer of confusion is, you know, we, a lot of our recommendations related to the plant and sizing things are, are caveated by saying we should, we should probably try to tackle inflow removal in the system first and then reassess to find out what your peak flow is and then look at sizing things in the plant. So, you know, that's, you know, that doesn't happen overnight. I mean, that's, that could be five, ten years, you know, down the road of, of having a good solid number, you know, so we're obviously at a point where we're trying to, you know, plan financially for the next 20 years as to, you know, what are some costs that we could be incurring, how does that impact rates, how do we prepare for that, you know, from a budgeting standpoint. And, and this plan, I think, is going to get you, it'll get you something that's probably conservative, that'll be higher than you ultimately are going to have. And then I think we need to talk about on the implementation and the, pr and the CIP side is what are the correct logical steps to take in terms of getting our, our hands around inflow and the peak flow of the planet. So, you know, any, whatever's written here, you know, is, is, is not really considering that you know, that sort of sequencing of things, you know, in, in the future, and we'll get into that in CIP for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked about sort of the cost benefit of where do we, where do we spend the money, and, and I think we all understand ideally you can remove the inflow and then well, life's a lot easier, but, mm -hmm. you know, the biggest, the biggest source of inflow comes with the biggest price tag, and it's that Kim Street project at $10 million, and as we talked last week, it seems like it's more appropriate to spend ten million dollars at the treatment plant rather than tackle that pipeline project. So now mm -hmm. we're we're stuck with the inflow, mm -hmm. and it doesn't seem like the consequences of uh, high inflow hurt us that much. I mean, because ultimately we've got to be able to go to the public and say we're going to raise your rates because we have to spend this money. And this is why, and and I don't know that there's a compelling reason to remove inflow. I, mean, I guess, I mean, other than it's good engineering practice. What, what about future regulatory drivers that might come out too? Well, yeah, that would that would actually help. Yeah. But you know, without those, you know, we don't have much of a story on inflow. Well, you, are, you will have a CMOM requirement. Well, just say your nifty's permit now or maybe the next one will have an we'll inflow component in it, right? CMOM yeah. and, and II, right? So it will become a regulatory requirement that you have a plan. And, and when, when does that come into effect? Probably when you get your next NIPTES permit, which so is... Any day. Any day. Any month. Yeah. yeah. But every, every community <coughs> around here is getting that. But my impression of those is that as long as you're making good faith efforts to remove mm -hmm. II, um, that's complying with the permit. Yep. And so there are plenty of places where we can work on removing inflow mm -hmm. that are financially manageable mm -hmm. as opposed to the big one. Right. And so I, I, I I'm a proponent for removing inflow. It's just how do we how do we come up with a plan that 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 we can justify? Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and from a treatment plant perspective, and John and Jim, correct me if anything I say might not be true. I'm concerned about especially getting beyond the intermediate pumps. So I would be comfortable <coughs> right now saying yes. Um, increase your flow through the influent flume so you don't have backups in the headworks. Um, and upgrade your flow meter so we actually know what's coming into the plant and then we can properly once we have that then we can design around that because we'll be getting constant data from what flows are actually coming to the plant but if, if we go down to the intermediate pumps and upgrade those for you know 35 mgd then you're looking at um what's going to happen in your secondary treatment system, what's going to happen in the aeration basins, and then are you going to start having more issues with your secondary clarifiers? Um, and especially it becomes a problem if you end up with a low nitrogen limit, and then it becomes a process issue because high II 
will affect the bacteria in your activated sludge system and then it becomes a bigger problem. So I, I can even see this as being phased, you know, decoupling some of these recommendations and saying let's fix the first constriction, but then the question would be for you guys, well what happens then? You know, like so right now you're getting backups in the Headworks facility, right? In the primaries. Thank yeah, you. but the other thing is, is that if we don't have the way of getting the water out of the plant, which is the biggest bottleneck is the effluent flow meter there, mm -hmm. which only allows 10 million gallons to go out. Right. So if you increase the, the uh, intermediate pump to 35 million gallons, basically, what it means is everything flows up out of the secondaries, across the lawn, and into the brook. Violation. Right. So if we don't address the outlet, uh, we're basically uh, creating a bigger problem than we started with. Right. So where does it all go now? Um, well Will we exceed uh, 10 million gallons? Yeah. It starts surcharging at the at the uh, di distribution box for the secondary clarifiers. Goes up on the grass. Luckily enough, it doesn't get to the brook. And then after that, we. Uh, rake up all the uh, plastics and whatever on the grass, mm -hmm. lime it, and then and go from there. So it is getting through the intermediate pump station? So uh, on a good yes. flow, it will. The, the, the flight pumps that we have now, the intermediate pump stations, will lift and because the venturi down the other, the, the, the flow meter down the other end, it's only good for 10. Mm -hmm. Well, we're pushing 20 million gallons at it, it will start surcharging our secondary clarifiers. Mm -hmm. Our so secondary clarifiers will also get high enough in that area where oil will start getting to our lower gear, gear uh, drives mm -hmm. and also surcharging right out there at that distribution box. Right. So, sounds like the effluent meter is also would also be a higher priority recommendation than the intermediate. From what, from what we've seen on the partial flume up near the control building, it hasn't really backed up into the headworks from the primary clarifiers. And, and if it has, it's probably done it twice since I've been there. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember one of them. So, so the bigger issue is the effluent. I, I think <laughs> so. Yeah. Is that because it didn't happen twice, or you get a lousy memory? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, something's leaving. You know? <laughs> I'm going to be on the train too. <laughs> uh, but it has to be catastrophic to, to, to back up through that partial flow. We have to have a, a serious event. Like we haven't had them mm -hmm. one, two, in 30 years. The, the, there's a bigger issue of the headworks going under water when there's eye and eye or heavy waters coming in from the city and it comes in so fast that the existing grit tanks and the, uh, the bar rack and that area right near it, it's coming in so fast it can't be handled mm -hmm. by that area, the headworks. That's why the headworks usually goes under water or we lose the pumps downstairs. It's not a question of getting out to the partial flume. The partial flume doesn't seem to be the, the issue as much as the effluent. And I don't mean to detract from the, the topic that we're on right now at the headworks. No. Do we have a flow schematic showing the unit processes? Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble ooh. keeping track of there is where all these one. elements are. Is there one in the, 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 the past six studies? Ten yes. million. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm struggling with. Yeah, I know. Where I can't come in. Where's it going? I, I, I can't. Right. I can see. You can't see, see it, but it's right here. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's right here. Okay. So, it's so there's a. Uh, oh, you right there. Right there. It's right down in here, right next to the. Uh, these Where are the four uh, contact tanks. Yeah. Yeah. Down in here is a pit. Yeah. Here. <laughs> figure six one. Yeah, that's that's a there. different. Yeah. Yeah. He's got, you know, oh, he's all right. Do you see that? The water okay. coming out is yeah. going underground, right? It's yeah. between yeah. the two. It's the favorite clarifiers. Let's well, see. It comes. What's there? That's, as that's it's coming in, in yeah. from the yeah. clarifiers, yeah. it comes down yes. into the effluent the yeah, pipe right here, across into here, and what kind of meter with the chlorine? 
up and through out here and then okay. across. So it's yeah. pipe, it's hard to pipe. Right. So Sorry. down in here is that coming down the bottom. Okay. Down so the pit there. So it's actually Three. heading in this direction. Correct. Okay. Gary? Yeah. So let's try that discussion again. There we go. Using okay. that. Well that helps me more than the yeah, yeah. So yeah, we don't have the flumes and the meters on in here. It's okay. Just point them out. But certainly uh you guys, is it upstream of the side stream return, right? It's a upstream of the return, isn't it? The meter? Or is it downstream of it? Well, yeah, you got your return flows. Do you capture those in oh your input meter? Down the, the return side stream goes into the secondary clarifiers. Okay, so. I mean, into the aeration and then into the. So, uh, so the meter is okay. between grid and primary. Oh, here, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is where the inflow meter is. That's the partial flume that yep. right. Dick can only measure to 22. Mm -hmm. <coughs> These are the intermediate lift pumps. So that's the second item that was identified as a hydraulic bottleneck. And then where my the hand there is where the uh, effluent meter and and flume is. So those are the no actually that's the outfall between the secondary clarifiers and disinfection is Just where okay. right there that's where you okay your that's what uh, you're talking about. Okay. The sure is okay. So those are the those are the three kind of hot spots that can be identified. Okay, so now looking at that, what are the elements of this this alternative? What what would we propose to do at each of these points? So the first one would be the partial flume upgrading that so that it could handle the the flows coming to the plant, so it could accurately measure the flows, and that and, would be between. And the is that considered a hydraulic restriction, or just just the meter can't record? The full flow. Is it backing up flow? Is the partial flow back up flow? The meter can't record it, and um, John and Jim were just saying that it's not a hydraulic restriction. It's very rare. Well, the meter, the, meter, the reason okay. the meter can't record it is because it act, the actual flume structure surcharges so it is above the ability of the yeah. meter to actually see. It. So when that flume surcharges, it can no longer record, basically. Okay. Okay. So it, it, it might not be a, so it might not be a hydraulic issue in terms of you know flooding and going onto the the lawn and the parking lot, but it's it's not it's not allowing the flow to do the plant as a ship. I mean, it's. it's but if I were to worry about what's the consequence of mm -hmm. of that being undersized, it sounds like it's not. First, we don't know what the flow is. That that's a pretty big consequence. But secondly, it doesn't sound like it affects. There's a unacceptable consequence like overflowing sewage. I'd agree with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's that in of itself is not something that I don't think is going to get DP on the back. To, okay. You know, screws and uh, stuff like mm -hmm. that. But so we have to. We need to know what the flow is. Mm -hmm. I, I would categorize that as something that is, is a good practice thing to take care of, but possibly not. With not a high priority. Concern, yeah. I think that's probably fair. Um, and with you know the idea of knowing how to design things down down the line. So the second one is the intermediate pumps, um, and that those are between the, the lift pumps are shown here on the diagram between the primary clarifier and the aeration tanks. So those lift pumps are getting close to the end of their design life, um, but they still still work, and they don't have there's not full redundancy in the lift pumps. Um, so um, we would recommend changing those out when the time comes. Again, that's not an immediate need, but um, if, you, if you do that, that's when you end up with, if you change them so that you could get, say, 35 MDD through the facility, that's when you're going to start having downstream consequences. Um, How old are they? I think they were put in 2002, I think. Yeah, they John or Jim? Early yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. Um, but the other thing is, by scaling that up, you also have to make sure that they're able to handle the low flows that are coming through, because we mm -hmm. have flows that drop down late at night to a million gallons. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the ability to ramp stuff down low enough to handle the low flow, I mean, you can run into uh, other issues. Well, so you have that jockey bump there, right? That smaller one? Right. So that's a fourth pump. So, so that's just a you know it's a design issue. You can do that. <coughs> um, the effluent flow meter, as we've heard, is a constriction. So that would need to be um, 
that that needs to be fixed regardless of whether or not we fix the intermediate pumps right away. It seems like that's a higher priority. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the effluent flow meter, as you said, is where the hand is on that diagram. And then um, the other piece is the effluent pumps, which are brand new. I mean, just a few years old. Um, but they weren't designed for 35 MGD. So if we started to get 35 MGD through the plant, then you're going to have issues with your effluent pumps. Do anyone know offhand what they're, <coughs> what they're rated for? Mm, probably... 21, 22, 21, yeah. 22. And, and when the flow exceeds the capacity of those pumps, what happens? The flow gets activated and the water dumps into the Old Mill River drainage system and then we, uh, if it can't go out of gravity, we'll fire up the pump station and pump it out. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been disinfected at that point. Yes, Correct. it has. Yeah, so what's the big deal? Nothing leaves the plant without going through the right. chlorination. Right. 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 So, so, so that seems to me to be a project that could be delayed. Delayed. Yep. If we wanted to spend money on something else instead. So, so there are definitely ways to ungroup yep. okay. some of these. That's great. We'll look at all of that. So it sounds like of those, I guess, of the, all of those items, the effluent flume is really the only one that is actually causing some sort of a backup where you have to do a spread line and actually kind of do some cleanup if those secondaries actually back up. Yeah. So that could be something that, you know, the state DEP could, could get wind of and start to care about if they, if it, you know, became something they were interested in. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's only once in five years? If they wanted to, yeah. I mean, even, even one violation is something that could, you know, it depends on it depends on what they're situating themselves to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, Northampton has been, has has done a good job historically and has not had ACOs and is not, you know, the CMP is not regulatory driven at all. It's because the city decided that's the right thing to do. So, I mean, I, I would characterize it as kind of a low risk, you know, but ul but ultimately if what we've talked about, that's I think what we're identifying is probably the highest priority of, of these elements of the weather. I wouldn't ignore the influence loan project mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, interestingly, the, the two pieces that seem to be mm -hmm. most important are the lowest price tags mm -hmm. out of this package. Well, that's good news, right? It's about the only good news <laughs> we've come across. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm having you talk, Pam. I think the bad news comes from you. Yeah, the bad the news comes from <laughs> um, I'm a little concerned about the what you were talking about, the headworks. Dave Michelson actually did the, the hydraulic analysis of this, so I think we need to just to look at that again. Mm -hmm. to make sure that... You always blame the guy that's not around. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw him under that's the good. bus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we liked Dave at the time, but now we're not sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Sounds like Johnny Damon. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get to the headworks. That's, that's, that's a separate one on the list. So. Yeah. And you, you need to do the analysis on that, so you, you, we can speak more to that um, later. All right, so then the next thing on our list is the um, secondary treatment system. I got the easy one. Yeah, first. Right, we started with the two hours. <laughs> um, and that one um, is, is highly, highly dependent upon what happens in the draft NIPTES permit that you get. And talking to regulators, they don't know. They won't tell you yet what kind of nitrogen removal they're going to be looking for from treatment plants along the Connecticut River. But it's been a pressure um, to reduce nitrogen. And in a previous uh, permit, it was required that the plant reduce or optimize operations to reduce nitrogen. And um, they've done that pretty well. So you now have a kind of semi quasi step feed system operating and it seems to be still in operation. Is that true? Yes, and it's yeah. working quite nicely. Yeah, and you're getting 8 to 10 mm -hmm. right now. So that's fabulous. Um, but if the state comes and says, okay, you need actually be the, the EPA would say, okay, no, we really need an 8 milligrams per liter. We'd have to look more closely to see if those increased, you wouldn't be able to, under current operations, you might not be able to make that 8 
anymore consistently. Or if they say it's going to be five, then you'd have to do a lot more work to really make sure that you are in compliance. So, and part of that depends, like if we're sending 35 MDD, it's a whole different animal trying to, you know, remove total nitrogen down to five if you have 35 million gallons coming through versus um, the design of 15. So, I've got a question for you, yes. Pam, on that. Because the nitrogen could be restricted to even less than eight. If we're going to go, if if we're if we're going by the Connecticut state of Connecticut's uh, footprint uh -huh. of how they deal with nitrogen, some some cities don't make their permit in Connecticut and they buy carbon. Uh, they buy credits. nitrogen credits. They buy credits. So you either get penalized or you can buy credits or you can. And some states, and in some cities in Connecticut have opted that it's cheaper for them to buy credits than to put in a whole new processes. Would we have that option here? I doubt it because um, in Massachusetts, the EPA has primacy over permits, whereas Connecticut, they run their own permitting system. And so the state of Connecticut came up with that nitrogen credit program. And we... But isn't Connecticut a driver on us? It's the Long Island Sound. So Connecticut's south of us, so they're putting the pressure, you know, so it's, it's moving upstream. They're even looking into Vermont. So well, I was just visualizing that if we're all part of a, a system, regardless of state, driven by the EPA, we might be able to buy credits from a Connecticut city? Um, the chances of that I see as being very slim. It's a great okay. idea, but I... I don't see that happening, especially because EPA has primacy here, meaning they write the permits, and they're pretty strict, um, and Connecticut is a different system, so you're, you're trying to get two governmental agencies to, to talk to each other, and... Okay, it's, <laughs> it's just one river and one Long Island Sound, though. I know, but we're talking... Okay. <laughs> it's a good question, but I, I don't see that as being a viable option, but it may be, which is part, part of our recommendation is to say, Let's wait and see what your permit says, because okay. it's working now. You're getting good effluent now. Nobody's complaining. You're meeting permit limit, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So once we get that permit, then we can reassess again, and hopefully by that time, some of the flow issues might have been worked out. Maybe by then you'll have better flow data coming into the plant, and we'll know what flows we need to design around. Um, so. John, Coca Cola is still fine tuning their treatment system, right? Yes, they are. As far as we know, they're still making improvements as we speak. No, there are different drivers in the secondary treatment. One is your effluent, right? Meeting effluent limits. The second one is going to be um, the condition of your equipment. And so the aeration system was upgraded in '96, I believe. So it's it's approaching the end of its design life and everything's in fairly good the blowers and are in fairly good condition now but at some point within the planning stages of this planning study they will need to be replaced um, this is also um, an area where you could save on energy costs um, the if you right now the aeration system the way it's being operated at the plant is not the most efficient because um, you don't have you're using you're kind of using your blowers towards their capacity right you don't have a lot of um, redundancy in the blowers I, I remember we had to change the operations because the way we, we were trying to operate it before um, there were restrictions in the airflow because most of the um, diffusers are on the front end um, and they they tapered downwards, whereas current operations tend to have anoxic zones in the front where you would have fewer diffusers. And so there's not a lot of flexibility in your operations now because of the arrangement of your diffusers and also because of the condition of the gates between the tanks, um, meaning they're not fully operational. <laughs> so, you know, if we could so I don't think it's an immediate need, but it, it will need to be addressed at some point. So, um, so, the, so our biggest recommendation is, is 
one, um, you are going to have to, within the planning horizon, you are going to have to upgrade the secondary treatment system. And then two, um, if you start any of those projects beforehand, um, before you figure out what your NIPTES permit is, make sure that you have flexibility in your designs so that you get the most bang for your buck. Um, so, are there particular questions about this, or do you want me to run through the particular items in the yeah, I'd like you to, let's talk about the different line items in the estimate, and okay. whether, because we were thinking that some of these um, probably should, could be done sooner than others. If this is a project that could be picked apart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, On this one, we have the condition of, of the tanks, as I just mentioned, and the, all of the, um, the valves and the gates. So that's one item that we would need to address, so valves and gates. So is that the tank repair? Tank repair, yep. Mm -hmm. We would also have the blower, upgrading the blowers and the aeration system as another one, so that would be the second one. A, that's a pretty big ticket item. And that's a big ticket item. Now the issue is if you're taking down your tanks to fix your aeration system, that would probably be the ideal time to, to fix your gate and valves, right? When, when the tanks are down. So even though monetarily and you might want to separate them in another sense, efficiency-wise as far as, you know, there are cost savings and efficiency of doing them at the same time. aeration system would be the other thing. Um, and then looking at the clarifiers, the um, all of the mechanisms in in the sludge pump, I think two of them have new mechanisms and the third one um, needs to be updated still, right? You had done... On the secondaries. Yeah, on the secondaries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Two, are, two are new. Two are new, but there's... Newish. Newish. So there's one more that needs to be done, and probably within the 20-year horizon, you would need to address the other two, right? So ultimately, all three will need to be done, but one of them would be a higher priority than the others. <coughs> um, I mentioned the aeration equipment. And then the other one is just playing with the process. So those are the big, the big three ticket items on the secondary. But uh, the pumps, the RAS and, and the WAS pumps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those are older. Those are much older. So those are probably the highest priority. Those pumps are since the 19. So we have high priority and higher. Yes. Yeah. Well, within <laughs> within the within the secondary treatment system. Yeah. yeah. So those would probably be. Um, the highest priority of all of them. Because they're all regional equipment. And are they giving you guys a lot of problems? Like, you're maintaining them well, you're not even using the, the WAS pumps, right? No, we aren't. But the, the RAS we are. And we're having uh, some issues, but nothing that can't be taken care of. Mm -hmm. That we know of. Uh, new secondary clarifier is a low priority? Um, if you're going to start sending 35 MTD um, through the plant, you would need to look at that and be a higher priority. So it's my understanding that we have very few effluent violations as far as TSS and BOD. And so it, at least the flows that go through the plant now through our secondaries okay. don't usually end up in a violation. Correct. Of course, we could be lucky that it's just not a sampling day. But, um, but as we look at all the elements of this, it, it seems like a new secondary clarifier is a lower priority than some of the other items that we talked about. Is that fair to say or not? I would say um, it kind of depends on what you do with the influent, with those intermediate pumps. If you're going to upgrade the intermediate pumps, I, it would probably be a higher priority. 
Would you disagree with that? No, no, I wouldn't. The problem yeah. is, is where do you put it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you're going to deal with 35 million gallons, no, I would right. disagree with it. And at the current flows, at the you get by, but you don't have full redundancy. Um, well, up to 22 million gallons, we, yeah. we seem to do okay, do quite well, and, and 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 then to take it just one step further, which is maybe not probably in the context, if we can't handle it with those existing pumps that we have, we have the redundancy of storage in the three primary clarifiers. There's 12 feet of head wall in, in each one of them. Plus, at that point, the water does have to come up another four feet, I would say, or five feet to start backing up in the partial flume that we have. And then finally, after that, it would get back into the headworks. So you have some... If and the worst case scenario would be the water backs up in the primary clarifiers and then comes out over the primary clarifiers and then into the drainage for mm -hmm. a letter has to be written what happened and, this, and, and basically at that point if there's no failures in the equipment then it's going to have to be a pretty good storm mm -hmm. so it's not in your mind so we're not thinking it's a high priority mm -hmm. But knowing that at full design capacity, yeah. that no, you have a restriction. So it seems like of this $10 million project, we've identified more than half of the costs as high priority. Just roughly. You know, I'm not trying to reach a conclusion here, mm -hmm. just getting a sense for what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. okay. right. So, any other questions about secondary treatment? So next we're going to move to the headworks. Do you want to take that? And you the analysis? Sure. So <coughs> with the headworks, um, the hydraulic issues and the backups aside for a moment, um, the the headworks is designed with the one and a half inch space um, bars. So basically, the space between each individual bar and the screen is one and a half inches, which is um, I guess consider it a coarse type of screening as opposed to a fine type screening, which would be anything you know from less than an inch, you know, half inch, quarter inch type spacing. And what basically plants these days all will have some sort of like a half inch or finer type screening. So to see only one and a half inches is, is a little wouldn't be considered good practice. It doesn't do a great job at um, protecting the downstream equipment, the grit tanks probably end up with a lot of these, you know, a lot of the bits and pieces probably come out of there and then the downstream, you know, um, clarifiers as well. And so the the configuration of those, um, the, the headworks was looked at, you know, as part of this evaluation. The problem with the influence channel of the headworks is that, I think it was only three feet deep or something like that, five? Very three, shallow. I think it's three feet shallow, which which doesn't leave you a lot of ability to um, go with a finer screen because if you go with a finer screen, you basically have you know that much less free area for the water to pass through. So you'll just actually add to the existing hydraulic issues to the plant. So um, we looked at one alternative, which was ignoring that, just replace everything in kinds. You know, just knowing that in 20 years you're probably going to have to do that. Um, we looked at an option where we could try to use the existing headworks facility and try to do an additional screening step downstream of the area of grit, which the channel at that point I think is five feet deep, so you have a little bit more cross-sectional area of your channel to entertain going to like a half inch, I think half inch is what I was using um, in the study, and um, that would do a much better job in terms of getting rid of um, some of the the finer particles that are now currently passing to the downstream. The um, and with that scenario, we would actually still maintain the one and a half inch core screen upstream of the area area grip facility just to you know prevent you know trees <laughs> and logs from getting to the area grip facility. Um, so you'd have these two systems that you'd be be operating, which you know isn't ideal, but it's it's working with what you have basically. 
Um, and then we looked at a couple scenarios of um, could we build a new a new headworks facility standalone elsewhere, um, parking lot area primarily is kind of where we were thinking that would have um, either a you know a standalone screening facility and then reuse what you have for area to grit because that system is generally okay, or or do you just combine all of those together into one you know larger new facility? And sort of abandon what you have or mothball what you have in the headworks. And ultimately, what we're recommending um, is the um, not the cheapest option. So it's worth talking about this. But basically, um, <coughs> the second option I, I talked about, which would be putting a new fine screen system downstream of area to grit, but within the footprint of the existing headworks building, would give you um, just better screen ability, you know, better protection of downstream equipment. And where the concept is that we could design it so that it's a you know a climber type screen that'll actually bring the screens to the to the main operating floor level, and then you would um, install a couple of screening washers and um, basically which ba which removes some of the organics from the screenings, uh, helps knock down odors and produces a, a better drier screening product, um, which you don't have now. So it's sort of I mean. I, I don't think any. I don't think anything working within existing headworks is fully ideal. If I had a clean piece of paper, I'd probably try to redesign it differently. But I think it's a it's a decent option um, to get better performance, you know, within within the, the footprint you have. Um, I'm not recommending either of the two new facilities just based on cost, and I I don't know that it's really that necessary <laughs> um, to to recommend spending that much. Um, Could you talk again about the benefits of fine screening and so what what would drive us to to do that other than then I understand it's sort of current practice in the industry but yep what, I mean what, how do we suffer because we don't have fine screening at, at facilities that um, you know every facility is going to pass some amount of solids through the screens no screen is, is going to pull it 100% out and so ultimately there's an accumulation of those those inorganics and those solids that pass through the screens into generally the quiescent, you know, downstream, um, you know, clarifiers, maybe the aeration tanks, etc. Over time, you know, a long period of time, um, those sediments will take up capacity in those tanks, and then you'll have to basically clean them every now and then. So it's really not, you know, the end of the world. It's just part of maintenance. So it's to be honest with you, it's it's something that plants. It happens at every plant. It's just the rate of of deposition. So. Um, I mean, do you guys sense that as a frequent issue for you to have to clean these things and, and worry about where your screenings are going? Or is this something that is kind of in the noise of, of just upkeep of the plant? <laughs> I guess it would be good to get your input on it. After big storm events, we will find the um, inorganic matter that gets that gets through the headworks. We'll find it down in some of the, our clarifiers. We'll find it all those, all, as far as the sludge process building, we'll find it. Yep. Mm -hmm. They'll end up in our thickeners from primary pumping. Is that, is that grit you're talking about? Yeah, grit. And some little rocks. Then rocks that might have been caught in a fine screen. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so they'll get down in there. They've already gone through the pumps, and we, every once in a while, have to replace an impeller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at this point, as our as we start taking more pumps apart, we're seeing our impellers after 30 years, they're pretty well worn out. For the RAS, <laughs> the primary. <laughs> You know. You only get 30 years out of them? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we haven't spent that much money on them. Yeah. But the motors we've had to change out yeah. a lot of times because of uh, water events. But and the, other, the other piece is if, if you want to upgrade to for the secondary treatment system, some of the options for, for upgrading to, say, an Atipo system or Biomag would require fine screening ahead of hand, uh, or IFAS requires fine screening ahead of hand. So you you could put it in front of the secondaries, or you could put it in the headworks, which is where we would recommend. If, if we just upgraded, if we just rehab the existing system, which is A2, and postpone fine screening, um, are there costs? If if eventually we put in fine screening, are there costs that we sort of incur twice because of that? Or, or could we sort of separate it out? Well, I suppose if you went 
let's say you went to a half inch spine screen and then ultimately the secondary that permit came around and somebody like like at down at Providence or Island we installed Kruger's IFAS system, they have to have six millimeter or a quarter inch, you know, fine screen. Mm -hmm. So if you and that's because they have the media sieves that are that size inside the um, aeration mm -hmm. tanks. So if you committed to like a half inch because hydraulically that was better than a quarter inch and then later you picked up this Kruger process or some other process that requires quarter inch, then yeah, you would have to basically rip out new screens and put quarter inch in. So I I, I could see potentially um, delaying, you know, selection of a fine screen and waiting to see what happens with, with the TN permit. I mean the other I guess the other it's a smaller thing, but operationally the the screenings currently um, when they get pulled out of the the um, the channel, they reside in the lower level and they need to get hauled up, you know, by like a bucket elevator or is it just like a manual hoist? A hoist, right? So to, to the upper level. So I mean, I guess from a operation standpoint, it'd be nice to be able to get those mechanically all the way up to the the, the first level with you know a, a taller screen, etc. So that, that was we have a screen after those though. So. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you still have the coarse one, and we didn't. That's a new. Far right, that was mm -hmm. place, right? So I wasn't entertaining eliminating that at this time. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I think operationally we could try to make it a little bit better and they're a little easier to use. Um, but I think the the driver potentially would be the selection of the, the treatment process right. the downstream and saving the equipment downstream equipment. So any pump you replace is going to continue to be damaged. Mm -hmm. okay. But for three million dollars, we could fix a lot of pumps. And it sounds like the pumps have done all right. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Could we go through the the line items in A2? Because it, there's more going on here, it seems, than just, there's some other basic improvements in this A2. Right, it's like new grid equipment is sort of the driver on this project. Yeah, so um, basically my, the grid equipment is, um, like we said, I think it's, it's the well, it's, it's old, it needs to be, it's sort of within the, the 20 year <coughs> planning period, probably needs to be replaced. 2011 year. Um, 2011. It, um, it functions fairly well. I think during peak flows, it might have, it, it may not, you know, perform optimally. But relative to some of the other processes, you know, functionally, I think we're okay. So the, the, I think the concept here is is primarily to kind of replace what you have, maybe make some optimizations where you can, but, but functionally it looks the same, feels the same. Mm -hmm. I believe one of the recommendations was, or one of the concerns was the um, the grit should be um, it should be processed a little bit. It should be clean, washed, and processed. And there should be two units for redundancy purposes, so that's that's in there, um, and that that again that's just you want to have redundancy based on all you know, all your equipment when you can. Um, so that's fun, that's primarily the top four items. Do you there. recall what the Headworks building improvements item is? Is that like envelope improvements or process related? Gas monitoring, HVAC control. Yeah, it was more building type improvements. Yep. Which are going to be higher priority because. Yeah. Of yeah. <coughs> How do you guys feel about the condition of the grid equipment? It's old. It's pretty well. Oh, well, we all are. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean you get, if you wanted to, re if you wanted to replace that, you'd you'd give yourself a a, a very good time span for uh, operational yeah. optimism. But it works. It works. It works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, as well as possible. You know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it doesn't get everything, but uh, yeah. it, it does collect a, a sizable amount of uh, rags and grit and stuff like that. And if you needed to have redundancy in the uh, in collecting the grit, I guess that would be that would be in something we could use. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Because if that one unit goes down, then it's a couple days or three days, depending on what parts we have, uh, that it could be not used. Therefore, we're collecting grit in the grit tanks, which then that can become an issue too. Mm -hmm. So 
conceivably maybe adding that redundancy could be a higher priority and then and then planning to maybe swap out the equipment itself you know down the road within like the 20-year horizon to something like so that's potentially something like a decoupling of, of grid items yep. So I, if I, I guess based on the conversation I'm hearing right, you know maybe we, maybe we try to split this up, the grit into, you know, just getting redundancy on the collection piece or the, the processing piece, and then on the screening almost just putting the uh, the fine tree decision on hold or, or, or pairing that with the permit driver, you know, kind of see what what comes around there. Seems reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Are there issues with the building that we need to look at code compliance in there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you talked about that there was some enhancements to electrical systems, lighting, architectural features, structural conditions, and then also talk about possible hazard and code compliance issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, do you want to speak on that more? I mean, the, the detail, to be honest, with fuzzy, to be honest. Well, but this is where, like, the... Did, did you, I guess the question is, did you cost those, are those included in your cost? Yeah, the three hundred thousand dollars. Three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, so they would, so the the things that were identified in the condition analysis, which included the HVAC system, and um, some electrical work to upgrade that to what it needs to be for compliance issues, is included in there and would be a higher priority than. I would assume that any time you go in any part of the building that that is uh, has building envelope or code compliance issues, <laughs> those are priority. Yeah. The minute you go in there, they're going to be part of the project, right? And, that's and, and maybe higher priority than the process. Could mm -hmm. be. Yeah. Yeah. From I what I understand. Yeah. We like our employees. You want to keep them yes. keep them healthy and alive. And <laughs> yeah. So. It's a new policy change, John. <laughs> <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I knew he was confused. <laughs> Mark has fluttered again for the <laughs> second time in a year. <laughs> With such a dinosaur here. <laughs> I guess we're going to have to move out some of the cavemen. <laughs> so yeah, clearly that can be parsed up into into more bits and pieces. So okay. And the, you know the yeah. Would you move those around in here, in this document, like the fine screen tying that to the the nitrogen, the, the secondaries, or because it's sort of like the scenarios are set up by the process point in the plant. Yeah. So. I don't know, if you start moving things around, I mean, on one level it makes certainly makes sense to do that. I think I would probably, I think for the sake of uh, ease, I think getting into and, and carrying this up is going to be probably not as beneficial as just leaving this as is and then moving into the CIP. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to take the cost estimates and break those apart yeah, on the back good. end, you yeah. know, because yeah, there's a lot of contingencies and things like that. Yeah. Um, so that, we, that we'll have to do, but I think on the CIP, I think we can easily explain away how we things up. Yeah, right. I think that's what I would prefer to do. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, we ready for primary treatment? I think so. Okay. So the the two um, things that we looked at for the primary treatment system were rehabilitating the existing um, clarifier mechanisms and primary sludge pumps, and the other one was replacing the clarifier mechanisms and primary sludge pumps. And this is an example where we chose the more expensive option, um, <coughs> primarily because um, we felt that if you rehabilitate the existing and refurbish, you're still rehabilitating and refurbishing equipment that's 35 plus years old, and you're going to be better off in the long run if you um, just replace um, and we're recommending to replace in kind um, the, the mechanisms. Things w work now, right, John? But you have to fix things periodically. And yeah, even the when equipment it was would Yeah, the equipment, no matter if it's brand new or it's 30 years old, has to be maintained. Right. Yeah. So. That was our recommendation, was, was to replace. I don't know if there's discussion or other thoughts on that. Well, on the mechanisms for the primary clarifiers, they they could probably be replaced, so you know you're, you have a good starting mm -hmm. point to go forward. 
as they're near the end of their their lifespan. Mm -hmm. The clarifiers themselves should be emptied, I guess, when they're all that's being replaced, they'll be emptied, and we'll take a look at the concrete, mm -hmm. see what's going on in there. Uh, primary sludge pumps, if replace them with brand new sludge pumps, and if the footprint that we have now is going to be able to be fit with the, the new pumps, it would be a pretty smooth operation. If it comes down that new pumps will not fit into our footprint, then there's going to be some alternatives to how to make it fit with the motors and, and, and such. But I would think that if you're going to change the primary sludge pumps, you should. Are we looking at changing the VFDs too? So yeah. Okay, from top to bottom. Okay, mm -hmm. that would be good for me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see something new there for once. So these both options include new primary sludge pumps. Is that correct? Um, no. The first one, A2, would be refurbishing the sludge pumps. I believe. Okay. But they both include working on the time yourself. Correct. Okay. Yes. What would we refurbish mean on the primary of the sludge pumps? Would that mean just changing like the impellers and keeping the keeping the old frames? Yeah. And then replace the VFDs or put new VFDs? I, I think the idea was to completely refurbish everything. So you wouldn't buy, you know, you'd buy new things that wear out, but the outside structures would, would stay okay. the same. Yeah. Those pump motors are new from last year or the rebuilt? The the motors yeah. are pretty new. Some of yeah, some are brand new. Right. Some have been cleaned and they're they're not at all flawed. He says yeah. yeah. Right. I think most of them are brand new. So the motors are pretty well set. So he actually said so for um, A2, the pump motors, VFDs, and instrumentation and controls would be replaced, um, but the pump impellers and seals and volutes would be rehabilitated and the pump bodies painted. Look like A3 would be the way to go. Yeah, because depending on you know what how much wear you had in the volutes, right. it would determine you know whether or not you were going to be able to. Don't put new pistons in a worn out engine. Right. I assume by going with A2, you'd also have some electrical efficiencies we could look at too. On that, they're already. I mean, they're VFD driven now, so I mean, they're probably fairly efficient. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think you'd probably look at sizing it, see where you are now in terms of motor efficiency, and maybe find a, a selection that's as efficient as you can get. So certainly that'd be part of it. Um, in terms of the INC, um, I don't really necessarily get gain any efficiencies by having you know better controls over it on, on this kind of a system. So I would I would I would hope that you'd have something a little bit more efficient, but. I'm not sure. Like it, it'll get the pump curves and stuff like that to get the right pump. So we're last week, John, we talked about a location where you, you only have one pump. Is that yeah, it's sludge? Is that a sludge pump? That is a a sludge thickening okay. pump. Okay. That so we have redundancy in this location. We haven't got there yet. Okay. Yep. So we're we're agreed with the A3 option on this one and not necessarily breaking it up because it seems I mean you could do you could do the pumps at a different time than you do the clarifier mechanisms so you, but they're all pretty old so it it it's a discussion last week led me to conclude that this is a rel relatively low priority I mean not a screaming high priority I guess is the way to look at it. Um, and then, if the pumps are in tough shape, then there might be enough, might be a need to separate those out. But I don't, I don't know enough to say that. We basically have to evaluate and see what's what. Yeah. You know how much, where there really is in there. Clearly, 
they're working okay today, as these guys would be telling us they're having a terrible time with them. So. So we could separate. We could, obviously we can yeah, ungroup those okay. as need arises. So we can keep them as separate. So the next one is residuals management, which Dave went into. And do you guys are you going to want to break at some point? What the hell, how are people doing? So far so good. Do you want to break? <laughs> <laughs> but if Dave's going to talk, I'll have it be. <laughs> I can just go take my own um, So with, with residuals management, um, I guess just kind of on the, some of the, the major pieces um, on the solid side is that um, the, the plant has a tough time getting through, you know, long weekends or high flows with, with solid production. Um, and that gets covered in another scenario you know, that specifically looks at um, the thickening and, and, and pumping of the sludge. So not really covered on, on this particular one. But um, what this residuals management one is kind of trying to take a step back and look at um, sort of big picture how solids are handled at the facility. Are there things that um, can be done on the solids train to have a positive payback or to um, just, just to change the process around? Um, kind of on the you know, industry-wide um, or in the state as well, there's there's a new or re-emphasis, I think, on going to um, beneficial reuse of solids and also trying to extract um, the energy that resides in solids. So solids can be, um, you know, they can be uh, incinerated, you know, to create power. They can be um, dried. Um, they can be um, digested to create uh, biogas. And biogas can then be used to run a, an engine, which you can then clear electricity and heat from. So sort of, um, I mean, there's a whole side of our industry that really deals with with solids, and it's um, it's pretty remarkable what you can do with it. Okay. And so, I think what my challenge here was to try to canvas sort of, you know, what what is being done, what what's a common practice, and does it have relevance or potential for for use here at Northampton? And um, one of the, I think the, the original intent of this when the scope was being put together was really to look at the digesters that you have at the plant that are uh, dormant and as far as I know were never really part of the, the way the plant was run even from almost day one. Um, well they were initially. Initially they, they did do the job that they were designed to but with the years and yeah. the greater flows that went through it the ability to actually digest them properly uh, was lost because we got to a point in the end where it was like a third of the time that it was supposed to be in there was okay. all that was actually in there. Yeah. So then it was difficult to uh, to digest the sludge. You ended up with a partially digested process, which was very hard to do water. You weren't getting the gas out of it that you were supposed to be. A lot of operational upsets. So it was sort of like for probably when it was first put in, it was fine, but as time went on mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, solids increased, it just got overwhelmed. Sort of like what's at Coke now, when they put in their digesters, it was all designed theoretically to be fine. And within a year, the production ramped up and they ended up blowing out of their digesters because they were never designed to take the loads that were put into it. Right. And that's still the issue we have today and, and the issue we'll continue to have, you know, if... You Not know, the same issue, plant. though. I think the input characteristics back in that day with, with uh, high loading rates from Coke were, were, were definitely different than what we're facing today, particularly since Coke just spent three million dollars building their own plant. So the, mm -hmm. the input characteristics, I think, that we have are probably considerably more stable than they <coughs> used to be. And the, the ability to control that anaerobic digestion process is probably um, easier than it would have been back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, Jim Dostal still is having nightmares about those anaerobic digestions and every once in a while he comes into my office with a crazed look <laughs> saying that anyone that talks about anaerobic digestion <laughs> is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so he was scarred for life I think yep. based on what, what we were facing back in the day but 
So a lot of thought would have to act and research would have to go into, you know, determining exactly what we've got coming in. I mean, obviously you can't tell exactly, but a good number of what you have coming in for your organics and what kind of a capacity you're going to need if you were going to go down that path. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree. And so we, I mean, I kind of looked at that the digestion process from you know an economic standpoint of you know if you were able to um, you know get the you know the flows through and actually get it back up and running again, what you might you know from a, on a paper exercise because we don't really know the characteristics of the sludge, um, what a typical gas production value might be, where you can convert that into electricity and heat, and then what sort of um, offsets that would co that would create the plant in terms of what you need from the grid for electricity, and then um, by reducing the sludge content because digestion is, is going to actually reduce the, the volatile so size, the volatile portion of your solids. So it'll reduce the amount of solids that you actually have to haul off site, and that's a, could be some substantial savings. So you kind of compare the the cost of op of building the digesters or, or re reconverting them, I'd say, with the savings. And um, you know, I, I estimated a, a payback of about 30 years, 32 years, <coughs> which is not attractive. Um, and I, I th kind of thought it'd be a little bit better than that, but um, that's what I came up with. Um, and that's using the existing size tanks. Yes, yeah, using existing size tanks. And then there's, I mean, in terms of the industry, there's a lot of there's a lot of other things. You know, you can um, there's like the the tea pad option, which is you would actually add a an additional digester in front of what you have now. So that would be sort of, um, what they call it, thermal phase inner digestion. So that first step would actually be operated at, you know, 120 degrees, 140 degrees, something in the thermophilic phase. And that's supposed to reduce the actual detention time you need in the mesophilic phase, which would be the digestion you have now. Um, that I didn't even look at because, I mean, it just, um, from a process control standpoint, you know, I kind of just had the, the sense that mesophilic digestion was almost, you know, too much to really consider now. And if you add in this additional step, um, it, it seemed like something that that maybe wasn't worth looking at, you know, at, at the moment. Well, and also um, space constrictions on the site. Where would you put the additional yeah. step and stuff like that? I mean, so there's, um, and what else did we look at? We, you know, we looked at things like aerobic digestion. So um, as opposed to anaerobic, aerobic digestion actually needs a, a longer holding time. So your tanks now wouldn't, wouldn't work, but there's a type of aerobic digestion called ATAD where um, the SRT actually is about 10 days or less. So you probably could convert the existing vessels into there. But for that, there's concerns about um, odor production, um, dewaterability of the solids, and you know, some other process type things. So um, we looked at that as like a, you know, maybe kind of a, an option for you. Um, composting, whether it's done, you know, by some, you know, someone else nearby or by the city, you know, maybe at um, a site that the city might own. Um, the plant itself probably doesn't have the space for it. Um, and the neighbors are, you know, the odor thing would be an issue. So um, we looked at composting kind of curs cursorily a little bit to see if there'd be any benefit to that. Um, so you know, just trying to canvas these things. Um, sort of newer technologies out there. Um, you, know, you can you can dry you know solids in um, like a drum dryer, and there's the ability to to capture the the energy back off that and feed that into the process. And that's um, I looked at a I think it was a Kruger Biocon dryer um, as as an option there. And then um, there's sort of these emerging technologies about. Um, I think it's the candy, is it the candy process on the side stream um, digestion. Oh, cannibal. Oh, cannibal. I get the, oh, the question cheese. But the cannibal is sort of um, an emerging technology that I've actually talked to Stevens about that, and they're sort of still, I think, in their research and development phase where they have a few installations in the states, and some are performing great, and some aren't performing well at all. So they're they're really not even looking at new customers there. So I didn't research that too much more, but. It seemed like from the technology standpoint, there's always new process type things that are coming out that you know look like they have good promise to them, but um, they are they are not ready yet, you know, to be to be implemented. We also asked the question of well, I mean, the state 
the state is now trying to push anaerobic digestion at various facilities. There, there's a new law that should be coming out this year that's banning organics um, from large um, processors like a hospital or a college campus or something like that. No longer can they dispose of organics in landfills. So what the state is doing is trying to create now a feedstock stream that can be processed at either new digestion facilities that get constructed by the state or at other facilities or at existing treatment plants that already have digesters that might have some capacity. So there's the sort of a new, I guess, feedstock out there um, for that kind of facility. And I know East Hampton was studying um, installing a, a, a like a biosolids facility for their purposes. And uh, UMass Amherst, um, I believe there's a new facility potentially sited over there. And um, Pam and I contacted both of the, the teams working on those kind of concept studies. And at this time, it didn't sound like either one of them were really even entertaining being like a regional facility for you know hosting other communities solids. It's really just the communities themselves that they're serving they were looking for. So um, you know there's no there's no immediate uh, option there, I don't think. So you know we tried to kind of canvas what what all the options are and, and put together, um, sort of a, I guess, a, a, a study of, of, of what's out there. And at this point, I mean, it just seems like there's, it would definitely need more time, energy, and focus than what, you know, we were able to put into this study, I think, to, to come to a, any real conclusion um, or any real solid recommendation of what you do. So sort of, it's, you know, it's kind of a <laughs> an in-between outcome. Um, but I think there's some foundation here of, of you know, what potential roads there may be um, without coming to an answer. I think more than anything on the solid side, the, uh, as, as time has gone on since a lot of the secondary plants were built in the 70s, the solid side has become more of um, sort of a privatized marketplace where um, originally plants were designed with incinerators or sludge only landfills or whatever associated with that plant so that you could manage your own solids in your own community within your own system. And as time has gone on, my experience has been that, you know, the vast majority of plants no longer do that and that there's more sort of vendor related um, uh, disposal management options for plants like ours. So whether it's going to Upper Blackstone or going to a pelletizing facility in, in, in Socket or Connecticut or whatever, just to try and get plugged in the way that we do right now through doing an RFP for, for disposal mm -hmm. and trying to set up the plant in a way that we can provide the solids to be hauled within the type of facility. Yeah. The states work pretty hard, I think, on really pushing anaerobic digestion. And one question yeah. I had about that was, um, I can't recall exactly about funding for these things, but um, I'm wondering whether there was grant funding specifically for AD development um, capacity within the state. Um, the food waste thing doesn't work so well out here for a number of reasons that I don't, I don't need to go into, but um, mm -hmm. I was wondering about the grants. Were there, were there grants for AD? Yeah, yeah for studying. It. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah, well, studying and, and, and actually for construction if you know, it has a separate you know, process. But yeah, the um, mass used to be the Mass Technology Collaborative, now the Clean Energy Center. Yeah. They offer, they have like a whole organics to energy component and they, they fund feasibility studies and, and things like that. And CHP or anaerobic digestion with CHP is kind of one of the central technologies that the state's focusing on. Yeah, it's like a big driver from the energy standpoint. It's almost yeah. like the state doesn't care about how we treat our wastewater, but if we can, if we can generate a few you know, electrons with it, they get all excited and they start yeah. throwing money at it. So um, it's a little bit of a disconnect yep. in terms of looking at it from a wastewater side. But yep. are, are those, I don't, is, is there a fair amount of money available? Because that would, your 30 year payback or whatever obviously would be impacted if you could get a few million bucks in a grant to help build something. I I fully suspect that you'd be able to fully fund a, a feasibility study through that program. Anything. I don't, I don't know if there's, I gotta look at the matching. If, I don't recall if there's a matching. There could be like a 25% matching on there, but I'm not, yeah. I'd have to look at that again. Um, Can we look at that? Yeah, I know. Do you, um, is there any interest in the community that you picked up on to do, do a better job with our sewage solids? No. A more environmentally sound practice? 
I think the issue. I mean, I think the. I think the, I think the issue is still the the, the decades-old issue with biosolids, which is perception of, you know, how clean it is, how suitable it is, oh. how, how, you know, and, and, and you know, I've, I've raised this in, in a bunch of meetings with Kleinfeld, they're probably tired of me hearing about it, but I think those, a lot of those public perception issues in terms of safety and content of biosolids still, still exist, I and mean, I, I don't see where those have ever been really overcome in terms of composting or, or things. Um, you know, even I was talking to uh, somebody that recently about the the pellets coming out of MWRA still going to Florida. For mm -hmm. the, you know, it's a long way to haul, but they're being used on on the orange groves and orchards and things down there. Right. And there's no local marketplace for it, um, so it's a hard thing. Yeah, we talked to some of those, those vendors, those you know supply. Um, you know, market vendors for you know what to do with those types of materials. You know, we talked like Casella and, and We Care Organics, etc. And kind of what you're saying, Jim, is true. Is that they're the what they kind of said is that in the New England area, it's just not pushed that hard. You know, like there's not a big not been marketed. Yeah the, yeah, the marketing effort's not there to try to get that education out there. So they just kind of go out of state where people are readily trying to, to get that kind of material, and it's it's valuable enough that you know you can. And get it down to Florida and still make some money off of it. So, mm. um, so yeah, I mean, until I, there may be there may be land, you know, and there may be agriculture, and there may actually be use for it here, but it's just not marketed. So, um, I think that's that's something that that's the reality of, of it up here. Um, How much can we save with the uh, contract following improvements? Yeah, so I was actually just going to get into that. So, you know. We did also talk to some, um, we talked with, uh, uh, who's the subcontract to now? Is it Casella? Is that where it's subbed up to? It's Casella's doing a, uh, it is the subcontract. Yeah. Then. Okay. Um, Casella basically, when we talked to them, they sort of, they said, they kind of gave us two, two pictures. They said there's the Northampton situation, there's the Westfield mass situation, where the two plants are pretty similar. Um, in terms of like the type of solids that's produced, the volume of solids that's produced. And they, Casella has to bid on the contract to do the hauling, and they're able to provide or, or bid a cheaper price to Westfield than they are Northampton, strictly because of the way that the loading facility is the plant, so the way the truck bay is configured. Um, and my understanding is that they can actually just have um, basically a truck bed or a, um, a trailer just kind of sit in there permanently and they can just drop it off and pull it out whereas here I think we have a couple of like um, 40 three bays right three bays with 40 yard dumpsters 40 yards yeah that have to be you back up you have to lift them out put them on yep so it, it's it's literally just that operation that actually costs you guys some extra money and so we talked with Casella what what physically would have to change and basically the that truck bay is like I don't know, three, four, or five feet too short <laughs> to put one of those um, types of um, trailers in there. And so this uh, this, al this alternative that we looked at, um, I think it was uh, a, a A2. Didn't, didn't they also say that the hanging conveyor system is a little bit too low too? Yes. Oh yeah, the head height there for the conveyor because there's a there's a, like a cross collector that comes from two spots above, and it can kind of be distributed across the the various bays, you know, in, in there. So that would have to be either re re engineered or maybe like a lower profile type type cross collector would have to be installed. So we looked at the cost to do, you know, those those kind of modifications versus what Casella sort of gave us as an idea for savings, which I think was fifteen dollars a ton or something like that. Um, and the payback on a on a um, O and M or on a life cycle cost. I think it's in this table here. Um, where's this one? Yeah, if, if you look at the residuals management or appendix A6, the life cycle cost for doing nothing was over 20 years was about 13.2 million, whereas just doing these modifications, the payback was the life cycle cost was about 12.1. So there's about, you know, over 20 years, there's about a $1 million savings to do these modifications. And 
So that kind of then begs the question, well, I mean, is it, is it worth making these kinds of modifications in a standalone scenario, you know, for these kinds of savings, which over 20 years, you know, it's, it's a savings, but I don't know, I, I guess I'd rely on you to tell me if, if that's a attractive savings or not. Um, but that's kind of um, directly from the haulers, you know, a recommendation that they would make, they would make today just to make the, the contract pricing a little bit cheaper. Um, you know, seemingly the, look, the number of locations for them to bring the materials to is, on the, is kind of on the decline. Um, they sometimes need to haul a little bit further, you know, to, to bring, to get someone to take the solids. And so that's going to drive prices. So I, I don't see the prices for contract hauling being stable. I see them going up over time. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, I guess, the background of that recommendation is that we see a, a slight savings and a more efficient operation and, and better control over hauling prices if, if you were to go ahead with this A2 scenario. Um, and then and then on the you know the bigger picture stuff they were talking about, I just I would hesitate to make a recommendation this time because I think more evaluations needed. What's the condition of the existing overhead conveyor? It was part of the 96 uh, upgrade. Uh, so it works. It works. It works after a fashion, but it is a maintenance nightmare. Um, right now we've got all kinds of tubing snaked everywhere to grease the bearings. Uh, but if we ever had a bearing failure up there, um, basically the thing would have to come down off the roof there to be worked on. There's no way to get up in there and work on anything. I think the headspace up there where it's near the roof is like what? 18, 18, 18, 18 inches, inches maybe? Less. So you can't even get the covers off to take a look and see the augers. These units are uh, 30 feet long, 40 feet long. Uh, you have to climb a ladder that you have to go up at least uh, 12, maybe 15 feet. Or use, a, or use a forklift to go up with a man cage to take a look. Uh, they're in a very, very bad space for uh, maintenance, and they're hanging off the ceiling. So we had one scenario this year where one of our gear reducers for driving the auger failed, and we had to take one train of the conveyor system gear reducer off in order to uh, keep the system working. You have, a, you have a, 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 a conveyor system where you have an auger going north to south and then that feeds to all the other systems going east to west. Well we had the, re, the, one, the big one that feeds all of them failed. So we had to start uh, cannibalizing one of the sludge bay equipment to make sure the other one worked. And uh, we're, we're, we got it working after a week but we were starting to get nervous about where we were going to put our sludge inventory. It, once that failed, you had no other methods to get that sludge from the dewatering equipment into a into a, a, a dumpster, but yet you were only 30, 30 feet away or 10 feet away. So we'd have to switch to liquid disposal well, at we'd that point. Go to storage and those two digesters we were talking yeah. about, and then in pure desperation we'd go to we'd go to uh, liquid. So looks like we save ninety thousand dollars a year in hauling costs. If we spend $390,000, I mean, that's a four to five year pay. That's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Plus, plus sort of the unidentified maintenance costs. We start with a new system instead of a 20 year old system. Right. And maybe something that's easier to maintain. There's, 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 there should be something better, better than that conveyor system. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. I think it's a fine recommendation. I would definitely, um, I don't know if anybody from Costello or other haulers have talked to you guys about that. Or Costello's been coming for years and talking about this issue, yeah, this yeah, exact yeah. topic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he didn't get the contract the last time and he didn't get it before. Okay. And uh, right now we have Cinegro, yeah. and I think they would, if we could get the bigger boxes in, I think they would provide them. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt, because they've already mentioned that if we could get trailer dumps in there, we'd be in there in a heart, we would trailer dumps. 
which are the bigger containers. Yep. And it's also e ease in handling and pulling them in, putting them out. You don't have to lift them. So it's not like a box is too over full. If it starts sliding down and it comes out the box, you have to clean up. Gravity is not our friend. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to skip to dewatering? Because that kind of kind of makes sense to makes sense to me yeah. to skip thickening now and go to dewatering. Yep. <laughs> what are you doing with those? I just have to grab a donut before we come back. Now we're on the solids. Thank you. Trying to you want to take care of the solids? Yeah. Uh, you get a boost here somehow. Yeah. Fall my fall my loop. With and without. So you can rationalize that those are healthy for you. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Yeah, I want it. There we go. Yeah, I'm alternatives for um, in the solid handling uh, dewatering area. Right now they have two belt filter presses that are up on the second floor of the dewatering building and um, they work and it's a, it's a good belt filter presses are uh, a good technology. They, um, solid, they're still out there. We can replace those in kind. Um, but we ended up looking at um, something that would give them a little more space, perhaps, um, and a little more capacity than what they currently have with the belt filter presses. So we could look at, um, the first option was to replace the belt filter presses um, with a new dewatering technology, and we looked at centrifuges as one option. Um, you can get a lot of, um, a lot more, a uh, higher loading rate under the centrifuges than you can onto belt filter presses. We also looked at um, replacing the belt filter presses with um, screw presses, which are generally s supposed to be more energy efficient than centrifuges, but for sizing wise, to get the for the solids through um, to treat all of them. Um, it would take up a little more room, and they're they um, have a lower loading rate. So part of part of why the centrifuges um, can treat a lot of solids is that it's a, it's more of a high rate process than the screw presses. Um, and then the other option was to replace the belt filter presses um, with a new technology, and also build a new dewatering building, um, and just do everything and just start anew. So that was one of the options, and that was much, much more expensive, and we did not end up recommending that option. We ended up recommending um, the centrifuges and the belt. Uh, the centrifuges were were the cheapest option, and that's why I recommended them. But my pricing came out pretty close for the screw press and the centrifuges. And what we did not do as part of this analysis is, is have vendors look at the actual your actual sludge. Um, what what vendors would want to do is look at your sludge, and from that, it would tell them you know how much polymer you would need, what type of polymer you would need, and how um, with that. And also, um, it would be important to get that data after Coke is pretty stabilized in their operations, so you know what's coming into your plant. So part of my, I think part of this pricing, we included the, um, say, didn't we include the, the conveyor system in the wiring? Yeah, I believe, that I, price is carried in here. I believe you did. Yeah. 
So depending on how you guys wanted to, to tackle that piece, I, I'm right now the cost for a new conveyor system is in the, the dewatering technology cost. The same conveyor that's in the other option? We didn't actually put the price in the other one. Is that true? Um, I think it was. I'm trying to remember something. Let's do it back here real quick. I thought what it was was the like the hanging conveyor and cross collector and the bay itself was in the solids one, but then like the the, the collectors in the second floor were on were in the dewatering one. I think we kind of screwed up that way from the right. Okay. Check this cost here. Because we might you know you might configure it completely different. Right. You know. So and if I recall um the entire process is in need of, of replacement and upgrading. Um, they're approaching their design life and they are going to need to be replaced or rehabilitated within this planning horizon. Um, the entire pump, this includes the entire um, feed pumps, um, polymer feed system, sludge storage blower, and process water booster pump system are all included in this. Did you include it at any point in here the piston pumps that are used to convey sludge from Hank's tank? Mm, I believe so. Um, Isn't that under gravity <coughs> taking and storage? Uh, or is that no. No, it's after that. It's after the, the after the gravity taking. Okay. There's three piston pumps downstairs next to the polymer pumps. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you included those. Are those different than the those are different than the feed pumps. Uh, do we have a schematic? Or no, okay, okay, yeah, you're right. You're, you're, the feed, the sludge feed idea. pumps are the piston oh, pumps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let's see. Yes. Excuse me. Okay. Well, this has it. <laughs> I'm learning my way around the plant. <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> yeah. It's not a detail, I don't think it's you know, what Pam's getting into. So, and the other, the other, the other issue with the belt filter presses and why we ended up not pursuing an option of just replacing those in kind is, is the, um, is the capacity issue for one and also that they're, they're more operator and maintenance intensive currently than a different system like the centrifuges and the screw presses. They're, they're more automated and they don't require an operator to be you know, there the entire time that the process is in operation. You know, you need you can go in, you can get it started, you can check on it, um, and then you can you can walk away and come back. Whereas with the belt filter presses, you have to have an operator on site most of the time, right? It's so we assign we yeah. historically we anybody who's been in the dewatering area has been assigned there for the full day. So I can't under, you know I can't picture a person turning them on and just walking away. see them running and then yeah. walking away yeah. without going back in a half hour to check things out or check polymer or mm -hmm. you know. so someone will be assigned there to, for, a, a, for a shift because mm -hmm. guaranteed once you say yeah you can just turn it on walk away come back later something you come back there'll be a there'll be a line broken or something like that or a pack and give loose and, mm -hmm. and they will come into a massive mess mm -hmm. So um, with the new centrifuge, so coupled with the new centrifuge and the screw presses, aside from um, aside from being able to run, like you could run the screw presses overnight, for instance, and not necessarily have somebody on site, would be, um, and we haven't talked about it yet, but more um, more controls and instrumentation that would allow you to monitor from not there, not being there. And so every every option, you know, our options all include upgrading instrumentation and controls and um, there's a SCADA system alternative where you can put in a that we'll talk about later that would allow you to monitor that process. You don't believe it. That, no, that would be a different kind of feeling for me to walk away from something like yeah. that. So I'm still going to have to pay someone to monitor it. Uh, so and I don't see a lot of Areas for decoupling in the dewatering area. 
unless you guys identified any. I think if we're going to go in there and upgrade, that you would upgrade the conveyors, you would ingre up just upgrade everything. There may be an issue with those piston pumps, for instance, where you might need to replace those first. Or So there may be things like, you know, polymer feed system. If you wanted to upgrade the polymer feed system, you might end up with, um, before upgrading, the, it might be upgrading something before you really knew what you were designing for, so you might need to have to do that at the same time. I have a question about your screw presses. Mm -hmm. I read a little bit about the Fournier rotary. Is this set up about the same type yeah. thing? Yeah. Where if uh, they come in, they come in a bank, yeah. and if one part needs to have maintenance, you can pull it apart and mm -hmm. still have the rest of the bank running. Would it be something set up like that with the screw press if you didn't go with the centrifuge? Yeah, yeah, you would need more, more than one. And I don't, I don't know how big they are. I've never seen them in real life. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you would have, you would have, re there would be redundancy built into it, so you could shut one down and work on another part of it. And have but, the rest but still keep, keep, keep running, moving right along. Right. And I understand from what I've read is the screw presses use less power than centrifuges yes but put out and then on the same level as the, the centrifuges they put out basically the same amount of uh, solids it could be almost 25 to 35 percent depending on the sludge going in and, and, yeah. the, and the polymer yeah it could yeah that's what they claim okay so you would end up, you would have a thicker sludge at the end. Right. Would be nice. Less hollow. Yep. So is the cent is the percent solids coming out of a centrifuge comparable to the screw press or? Yeah. It is, because that ends up impacting your disposal cost ultimately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so would it, oh, be, oh, oh, right. would it be drier than what we're? Right now, with the belt filters? Mm -hmm. right now we're doing okay. 20 percent, 21 if we're lucky. Yeah. If we're in a good, the real premium zone of 22, uh, 22 to 21. Yeah. But normally around 19 to 20. Uh, it's not great. Yeah. But if we get it up 25 or 30 percent, it would definitely lower the weight that's being hauled and right. then that would So all we're doing is hauling water. Right. Yep. And uh, supposedly the centrifuge, you could probably get a even thicker sludge, and it could probably do it since it's higher capacity, you do it quicker. So thicker there, than what? Uh, thicker than the screw press. Okay. Um, but that is highly dependent on your sludge, and we haven't nobody's really looked at mm -hmm. the sludge yet. So how prevalent is the use of a screw press? That's a good question. Um, I think it's in cer certain certain. Um, it's being used. It's definitely becoming more and more prevalent, but it's it's um, it kind of depends on the size of the plant as to how far you know how useful it is. So I think for the, the size of your plant, it had to be run more. So I think the cost savings I was I was thinking from the energy side didn't appear to be as big of a deal. Like you didn't seem to get as much of a cost savings because you had to run it longer because of the capacity issue, whereas with the centrifuges, yes, it's more energy intensive, but you don't have to. A shorter run. Shorter run. But you, at least your preliminary estimates show that the screw press is $112,000 less a year than the centrifuge. But my comment is all these sludge processing systems equipment go through terrible growing pains mm -hmm. and you don't want to get caught in the beginning of any cycle because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a nightmare and so mm -hmm. a proven tried and true is is a much better place to be than experimental mm -hmm. well, I guess they've been using the uh, the Fournier rotary press up in Canada for a while because that's where they were first developed okay. and it's only been in the last four or five years They've been migrating down to the states here. So the follow-up question to that, or it's the same idea is who can we call and ask them about how they like their equipment? And that would be how I'd want to base my analysis yeah. is running it and what are the problems. Mm -hmm. 
So that would be, um, you know, if you if you decide, okay, we're going to replace the belt filter presses. At that point, you would you would hire an engineer to to you know collect sludge, work with the vendors to look at the sludge, um, and give you more cost estimates. And then you would you would call plants and say, mm. okay, w what do you think of this screw press? What do you think of the centrifuge? Is it working for you? What are the problems you're having with it? And, and go from there. I actually think we go we go through this evaluation of technology again yeah. Yeah. if we committed to the project. Right. Because yep. they're close enough, right? I mean, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. So I, I think probably our decision is do we endorse replacing the belt presses with a new technology? Yeah. And it would help me again just to hear what our problems are with the current presses. I know we talked about it last week, but right. it escapes me. So. Well, they're definitely uh, showing their age. Right. Um, I know the one press that we run predominantly, the Klein, uh, is the oldest of the two. Um, we beat the heck out of it, and it just keeps putting out, but if it's showing its age, it definitely needs stuff rebuilt on it, and that would be... Um, Pretty pretty sizable cost. I know trying to get parts for it because it has uh, pneumatic uh, paddles mm -hmm. to keep the the belt stacking properly. And right now those uh, actuators um, that we used to be able to get are no longer available. Mm -hmm. What they have are entirely different size, so somebody would have to actually go and try and build out some sort of a, a, a structure to hold them in the right position so that they could uh, move the paddles properly. Um, How old's the machine? Boy, that one's from uh, early Yeah, probably early 90, 80, 89, 80, 89. No, a little later than that, because I started in 89, so it's probably about three three years 90, after that. 92. So it's yeah. it was a refurbished machine that came down just to show us what filter press technology can do. It was a refurbished machine at the time? Yes. yes. It, was, it was going all over the it country was, showing was, everybody what a, a filter press can do. It. And this is the two meter one? This is yes. the two meter press, correct. And the one and a half? Ashbrook. Is how old? Uh, that was that the new upgrade, the right, 96 exactly. upgrade. So by the time we do anything, that will be 20 years old and the other will be 25 plus. Yeah. I had a couple of stars near this one from last time. I did, I, I did too, yeah. I, but I just wanted to refresh my memory on why why we decided that it was a priority. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a takeaway from the last thing I had noted too. Yeah. We do refurbished and old and rejected and rebuilt well here. <laughs> it's a trend, a trend I think we should get away from. Running out of Bondo. Okay. The, yeah. the belt fit filter presses replaced Centrifuges? Is that what yes. you had? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the centrifuges were um, basically coming apart inside. Um, that was going to be a major, major cost to try and redo that. The whole basket inside was so worn that basically we were getting 12 to 14 percent solids out of them. Uh -oh. You would have to process sometimes 24 hours a day, five, six days a week to handle our solids yeah, coming in. Mush. And we were getting yeah. just you know, water spurts or grit. You know what would be interesting is to see what kind of um, operating costs differences there would be between the current belt press operation and the and a new technology. I think I did that. I didn't present it here, but I can get you. Yeah, I mean, if, if we have to argue that we need to replace the equipment, age and maintenance and all those issues are some arguments. But if there's a if there's a compelling argument that we might save annual costs, that that would help. Okay. With a higher solids output, that should be a definite big cost savings right there. Right. That's what I'm thinking. So it would have to go get tied into sludge disposal too, mm -hmm. you know, not just the unit process, but. So I can I can add that back into the draft as an yeah. option. Yeah. So However, you think yeah. it fits. Any 
I guess the reason why I suggested skipping to dewatering <coughs> is because we're talking about with uh, residuals management and that truck bay. You know, Pam and I were talking about those those two projects could potentially be combined mm -hmm. pretty easily because yep. we're dealing with you're dealing with sort of the conveyor system, you're dealing with the building, you're dealing with the uh, how you're going to get it from the second floor to the first floor, so what sort of penetrations of the slab you need. Exactly. So I could I could see the you know the residuals was a fairly small number. Um, I can see that being tacked on to this potentially. Mm -hmm. So I know we're talking about parsing things. I'm, I'm now I'm talking about aggregating things. <laughs> 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 I think it just makes sense to combine them in this case. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious about the space uh, requirements for a centrifuge versus a, uh, a belt press. Would it, would it uh, take up less space? And if it was so, would that mean you could move the conveyor system above the floor? Yes. So that you could it would solve your height restrictions and also dramatically improve your maintenance capabilities, I would think. Yeah. Well, also, if we're moving to a a, um, a truck roll-off, I mean, that's only going to be one one disposal spot. So I don't think you even, I don't, I don't even know if you still have that, you know, overhead cross collector in the bed. It might just be a simple shoot through the floor. But that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. If you can move the from hanging off the ceiling to the floor above by yeah. yeah. saving right. space by a centrifuge yeah. or, a, yeah. okay. or a screw press. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you get the material, the process material, to the spot where you're dropping it into the yeah. trucks, right. to trailers, or whatever it's going to be? Whatever that system is, it's above the floor. Okay. So you, if you're doing maintenance, you're standing next to it rather than Stand having it up over your head. Yeah, exactly. hey, you're, yeah you're, it's easier. Exactly. Yep. So it's almost just a whole rethinking of how you transport things from the second floor to the first yep. floor and, and things like that. And the way I'm thinking about it, that's exactly why you would aggregate those. Yeah. Because yep. one makes would the improvement. Yeah. It, it uh, allows for the improvement to the other. Yep. So Coca-Cola at their plant, they have everything on a single floor. Their centrifuge and then their little conveyor. It's a little conveyor up into a box. And right. then they, I think they can move their conveyor. It does. It moves back and forth. Back and forth. And they kill the box. Jim, Jim worked at uh, Holyoke and they had a conveyor system to the boxes there. Right. They actually had uh, a garage set up and they would have a box back into either side. And what they had was what amounted to a traveling bridge coming across so that they could, you know, fill the box on an even base. And, of course, at the time I was there, they didn't have the, uh, the uh, belt filter presses that they have now. They had coil filters, so older technology. And those you dump out onto a conveyor, straight across onto the traveling bridge conveyor, and, and then they could control where it was going, which direction it was going to, to deal with which box. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much all out in the open. You could see what was going on. You had fairly easy access to the grease fittings. Um, if you had to, you know, change out the bearing or something like that, it was something that you could work on. Yeah. So are we are we done with the watering? Okay. So it almost it almost sounds like we're I mean at the moment we're recommending centrifuges but we can almost we can almost pull that back a step and just say we're we're recommending a new technology but we need the vendors to evaluate it. We want to look at a few units and make a decision down the road. Um, yeah, kind of we recommend. Yeah, we're recommending a new technology right now. Centrifuges yeah. look better, but they should look at it. Yeah. Somebody should look at the slide. Yeah, I believe there's two types of centrifuges: high speed, low speed. So each one probably has a, a plus and minus. Yeah, and then you have to look at the different centrifuge vendors, and you know, so it takes a whole whole other process. Well, th with the dewatering equipment, do we do we go backwards to the polymer feeds? Uh, I would think you'd have to. Yeah. Because right now we're basically a very manual operation. We mix it by each batch by hand, mm -hmm. and we we'll probably be looking at something different there. More automated system. A reliable automated system yeah. with a fail-safe. 
I don't know if there's any fail safe. <laughs> One that we can go to manual. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. to have that redundancy. Yeah, redundancy. All right. Well, so sticking, so staying with um, solid. The another higher priority. This is going to be one of the higher priority recommendations. Is um, something to handle uh, pick and sludge. The three options that were considered. Uh, one, uh, A4A was considered um, install a third gravity thickener so that there's more capacity. So what we would do is if you look at um, you look at the di uh, overhead of the plant. Um, the gravity thickeners are just to the right of the secondary clarifiers. These are the gravity thickeners here. We're looking at a gravity thickener. You're right. Right there. That's a line. So there's a gravity thickener right there. And there's okay. currently two, so there's one on each side. Uh, are they in an enclosure? Yeah, that's yes. an enclosure. Oh, I got you. That's mm -hmm. cir one circle here, one yep. circle yep. there, and then there's a cavity. In the gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, the gravity thickeners are the really the bottleneck in the solid processing system. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah. So um, something needs to be done about that. And so the, the one option would be to install a third gravity thickener and the recommendation would be to the idea would be to put it to demolish the line silo which is next to the sludge building um, kind of in the middle of the square yeah. above the yeah, the shadow of it oh okay I, you oh yeah it. you can see the shadow yeah cool. if i recall our conversation of last week was well, we could tear this one down into a smaller project by just additional tank you tankage you needed, correct? Yes. That's what we discussed. Okay. So should we let me so I'll go through the alternatives that we talked in and you can tell okay. me what you guys talked about. Mm -hmm. Um the other one was to install a dedicated thickened sludge storage tank. So instead of a whole new gravity instead of spreading out the gravity thickeners, install a tank in that same location. Um, and the third alternative would be to thicken the waz separately so you have more, it, so what you would just have in the thickeners would be your primary sludge and then your secondary sludge would be, um, the waste activated sludge would be thickened in another location with another process and then you would need also as part of that you would also need somewhere to store that, store that sludge. Uh, we ended up not Part of the reason for not recommending that was you kind of have already had a separated WAS sludge system, and it was not preferable. You didn't, you kind of felt like you were doing things twice. It didn't work. It didn't work. So it was too many moves to get the same end result. We could actually get the sludge up to six to eight percent solids on, your on, that, on that belt thickener. Oh. Uh -huh. The problem was is we couldn't get it out of there. So we had no way of conveying it out of there and into the storage tank and having to get it over for dewatering. Oh, well that's a problem. And the, the pumps that were installed for that failed on such a frequent basis that pretty much we abandoned the whole thing because the operators were basically washing most of it down the drain mm -hmm. because they couldn't get it out of the out of the tank and over the storage. Mm -hmm. So we so came up. Uh, a massive waste of effort. Mm -hmm. So very interesting, though. That's it's a it's a unit process that other treatment plants use mm -hmm. successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah. could be, but right. So it sounds like you got the wrong equipment. Mm -hmm. This would make it work. Properly, yeah. yeah, yeah. I I understand what you're saying, but um, it's it's a pretty common practice. Yeah, Do you I spell understand that. Because you have one belt thickener to thicken the. Yeah, we had the one belt thickener, and we could get it up to six to eight percent. You still have the thickener? Oh yeah, it still exists. Um, but Almost the, brand the, new. the pumping that exists there um, would not handle the solids coming out of there. Uh, the yeah. pressure switches tripped, and those things went down yeah. constantly. Yeah. 
Hmm. Um, even when they, the manufacturers suggested a, uh, a hardened check that went in there, said that would work better, that worked even worse than the original ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically it was, the, the operators were tearing their hair out, More work trying to get worth. something yeah. that would work, and we finally abandoned it because we were beating our heads against the wall and accomplishing nothing. And spending a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And Pam, your, your option shows that it, it's not cost effective anyway. Isn't that cost effective? So maybe if we could use this. You put in a new were you using a thickener press? Um Probably no, it was it, it was uh, I believe centrifuge. Centrifuge. Okay. centrifuge. Um but then mm -hmm. it, it cost wise it fell you know it fell off the table. And mm -hmm. since they'd had experience with mm -hmm. separate systems before and weren't excited about it, we didn't push that issue. The other issue we had with it is when we were able to get it over to the storage tanks um, and then they had that uh, coarse air bubble diffuser to try and keep it aerated but the odor control system that was hooked up to that was not able to draw off enough air and so we had a lot of odors basically being pushed out by the blowers and we pretty much had the neighborhood in, up in arms because of it. So it was like. Mm -hmm. it didn't work. George A. Came, George Andrew Key just came down because he, we kept telling him it was bad, bad. And he came down one one day and he took one whim of it and shut it down. <laughs> now. <laughs> um, so ultimately, we recommended the um, the dedicated thickened sludge storage tank because it would be easier to operate. You wouldn't have to operate a third thickener. You could just send what you thickened to the storage tank, help move things through that thickener. Um, so it would provide you the additional storage that you needed um, and some process flexibility um, so that you could run those gravity thickeners at a lower blanket and they, they wouldn't overflow. What was the reasoning with that sludge, sludge storage tank to have uh, diffused air in it as opposed to a mechanized Mechanized aerator and mechanized, th well, not aerator, but you're you're still trying to thicken it, aren't you? Um, well, it's just a storage tank, the thickened sludge storage. storage tank. Um, because with with diffused air, what you're doing is you're you're rolling it around, and the aerosols and the odors are now coming out of it. Well, it would have an odor control, system. which is more more so equipment, more cost. As opposed to if you had a, a clarifier, another clarifier that you could just put another mechanism in there like we have ex existing, mm -hmm. you would not be releasing the aerosols out of the sludge and still have storage capacity in a third tank. Mm -hmm. But I, I, but I, I want to hear. Uh, you know, I, I, I went off the track a little bit here. Well, so I mean. <coughs> I mean, we looked at installing, so you're saying if you just do a third gravity thickener yeah. that you're not going to have to deal with the same odors, but you are, you still, gravity thickeners still are going to have odors. But not so as much as an air, not as much as some sludge that's being aerated. But in, e yeah, in either case, you need to, you're going to have to deal with You have odors. to have containment, but yep. you don't have all the existing equipment with right now with my, my thickeners that I have, I just have air drawed off. And that goes to the odor control building. And what we're talking here with a storage uh, tank, with uh, air being used as a mixer, mm -hmm. you're you're going to you're going to have to have some kind of. Uh, we're going to generate more odors than your than we than with the existing thickeners. Mm -hmm. Well, but in in any event, when we look at the odor the odor section, we are, you're going to have to deal with odors either way. So maybe there will be more odors, okay. but those were, I mean, it was costed out and s sludge storage looks like it's going to be cheaper. With this sludge storage tank, can I pump my WAS and my primary sludge there directly? No, because it, it would be after after you thicken. So then, where is my redundancy in my thickeners that when I want to take a thickener down for cleaning and maintenance, even with this storage tank, um, 
I'm not getting the full picture of why a storage a sludge storage tank between the digester building and the thickened the thickener building is a is the biggest necessity or the an answer to the the problem of I have two thickeners right now mm -hmm. that when I want to take one down I don't have I don't third have tank. one. I can't take one down because I don't have redu I don't have a third one. But I also at the same time even if I you have the weekends if we had a lot of sludge build up we had the overflow which is driving this thing. Mm -hmm. If I have the third little clarifier I can put flow in there and not have the overflow back into the side stream. So where does a well, so you wouldn't have, you're not going to have overflow because you're going to be able to operate at a lower blank. I'm going to keep, pump, I'm going to be just pumping automatically with no one there. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying you, you can operate at different conditions so that you have, you're pumping more frequently into the sludge storage tank. So it can store the sludge so that you don't have to be processing it right away. You know what I'm saying? You have a holding tank. So that so that you can operate your sludge blanket and the thickeners a little less, so you have a little more room in there. Would the storage tank be as big as a new little clarifier? Um, well, the design parameters for the sludge storage. It tank was 20 feet wide by 47 long by 12 feet deep, page 150. So the sludge, yes. So 30 by 10 versus. Because if we're talking sludge storage, why can't I sludge store uh, store sludge in a another thickener? Well, see, it's like an equalization tank in a way, so it's already thickened and then it can stabilize the process, the sludge that's not stabilized that's the wrong word but um, I have I have I have excuse me I have thickeners and I have pumps I'll mm -hmm. pump from my thickeners to my storage tank now I have to pump from my storage tank to the sludge process building to that to my other Hanks tank well no you can or take you that out of service and that could be an overflow that could be a backup so you would pump from this new sludge storage directly to your So process. I'm replacing Hank's tank with a, a new storage tank. What's Hank's tank? But I'm not getting another <laughs> clarifier. <laughs> Who's Hank? Who? Who's Hank? <laughs> There's a person who made a tank. <laughs> One of our guys made a tank? No, it was somebody's no, no. name that was on the original engineering dry, drawings there. It's Hank's tank. Yes. It's, it's, in, it it's Hank's inside tank. the sludge process building and that's or right now. It's, it's right now where the thickener building gets their thickened sludge pump. Gotcha. Tool. It's like a day tank. Uh, yeah, eight, it's 8,000 gallons. Okay. Well, big day tank. Oh. Okay, uh, okay, I'm going to let you go. Well, I think, I think this is a, a good discussion because I, you know, we talked about this last week and, and John makes some interesting points that, um, and it, it sort of keys on operational flexibility and odor control. And do we have to be more aggressive with odor control with a with an aerated um, storage tank than with a thickener, where you can the conditions are more quiescent and you don't right. perhaps generate as many odors. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and could you take a tank down for maintenance with the storage tank? I think that was another thing, right? Yeah. Could you take one of the tanks down temporarily to do well, maintenance? One of the thickeners. I mean, one of the down? thickeners. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you could, right? Couldn't you? I mean, if you right now, this is the if, I, if, if I take a tank down uh, to pump, to take it down, let's say I pump it over to the storage thickener tank, mm -hmm. I'm still going to have twice as much flow that we normally have to a thickener coming to the only thickener that I have. Right. But if I had a third thickener, which would be one which we, we, we would use with a lower blankets and not have the overflow on the weekends and be able to take uh, uh, a lot of 
a lot of product coming into it, primary and WAS. If I took one of them down to clean, I'd still have two thickeners <coughs> online and not be hard pressed to manage my sludge inventory depths in order to do some maintenance. I think the issue is that with the um, with the, the sludge storage tank and that you can operate the thickeners, you know, at a lower level. You know what I'm saying? So you you can you don't have to store as much in the thickeners. You're not storing the thickeners. So you're storing in that other tank, which means that you could then, if you needed to operate on one of the thickeners, if you needed to work on one of them, you would have the capacity during low flow conditions or whatever to to take one offline. So if you're if you're if they're sized properly, you, should, you know, you should be able to do that. Yeah, see, the problem is, is that each one of those thickeners only holds about 80,000 gallons. And we're feeding, what, about 120,000 gallons of waste activated sludge and 600,000 gallons from the primaries. That's basically flowing across the two tanks. Um, and we do get pretty good settling in there and, and are able to capture a lot of the solids. But the problem is, is when you cut that capacity in half, mm -hmm. uh, you've got that same flow going through the same, through half the volume as you had before. And so it doesn't take very long before you are flowing out and over and back to the headworks and recycling your solids. Uh, our time now for when we can get in and pump a tank down um, and actually do some maintenance in it is like by the time we get it pumped down we've probably got minutes to do what we need to do before we have to put it back online again which doesn't give you enough time to check the flights to check uh, get any rags that have accumulated in there um, so an ex what John is saying that an extra thickener would be more of a benefit from a maintenance standpoint than a storage uh, storage tank for the solids. Mm -hmm. So could you could you process what's in the storage tank? Like if you're going to plan to take them down, process what's in the storage storage tank, and then send unthickened sludge to the storage tank, and then route it back to the... Uh, I have no idea how that storage tank's going to go... Well, I mean, it's it's how you design it. I mean, you, so there's there's options there, but if you guys... Uh, I was just looking at simplicity. Yeah. If, in, in the way I look at simplicity. I, I, I have two tanks that periodically are overflowing. If I have a third one, I can reduce that, but I don't see... My, in my mind's eye, I don't see a benefit of a storage tank. If I still have the two thickeners, which I still have a need for a thickener, and, I, and somehow I'm not getting the, the 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 easy transition to say that a sludge storage tank is making me feel better that I only still have two thickeners. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a, store, a sludge storage tank. It's, it's 8,000 gallons. It's a day tank. But why would I need a bigger one if I had three thickeners that would ease ease the sludge inventory and also give us ample time? to take a thickener, a thickener off for, let's say, two weeks. Let's say I have to get a part, and I don't have the part, and, and that part takes two, three, a month to get. I can't be with just one thickener and a storage tank that somehow now I have to reroute sludge someplace. It, do you, do you sort of follow me in that? I, I do. And uh, maybe maybe I'm off base. You know, John, someone can step up to the plate and let John, me know. Wouldn't a wouldn't a storage tank allow you to you'd you'd move the solids out of the the one thickener that was running, you'd move those solids out faster and over to your storage tank? Yeah, but faster isn't always better because of the fact that the faster Coney. you draw out of the bottom of the tank the lower the solids are. So okay. you would actually get to a point where instead of drawing across 3% solids or so, you'd be drawing across maybe a 1%. So you solids. think you wouldn't have enough time to thicken 
Correct. In one tank, and you you. You know, it, it's a balancing so, act. So, so it's a gravity based in, system. In right. coming up with your preliminary recommendation, how much were you driven by the cost difference as opposed to process considerations? Would you say? Well, I have to admit that um, Dave Michelson came up with this particular one. And do you remember? <laughs> the, do you know? <laughs> did you talk to him about that? Well, the one thing that we haven't talked about is, is the amount of like days of storage that you have, you know, where you, you know, we always talked about how these like, you know, long weekends, you know, right. where you'd have to have somebody staffed, you know, the weekend to do, you know, you couldn't walk away over a long weekend and not come back and do solid processing. So that was one thing that was important, I think, to us in the evaluation was, was how many days can you, can you actually, you know, store, basically. And I'm just, I'm just looking at these two, combining these two basic designs and the option where you have a third gravity thickener under current design, under current flows, you have four days. But under the design, like so if the plant comes to the design capacity, you have 2.4 days, mm -hmm. which would be a little bit less than, you know, a three day long weekend or something like that, or, you know, that kind of a thing. Whereas that this, the tank, the, the off, you know, the, the storage tank had 6.2 days of storage capacity under current flows and 3.6 days under future flows. So I, I think the narrative probably isn't really that clear to me, which is looking at it now, um, in explaining the benefits to the, um, the, gra the, the storage tank. And I'm just jumping at that as, as one to see the benefit that we were really targeting having more than three days of storage at, um, at design flows. But you could just make the thickener bigger. Potentially. Yeah, I mean, but you have space in the too. Oh. Well, that's the cool. thing is this, this um, if the additional stu sludge storage volume under the thickener is 31,000 gallons versus 82,000 gallons in our storage tank. So that's where you're getting your additional storage. Fair so, yeah, as you reconsider this, um, it, it wasn't clear to me that that odor control. I saw that there's a cover in here to contain odors, but it wasn't it wasn't clear to me that the odor control equipment is included for both options, and so we want to make sure that. Yeah, I think I think we included the odor control in the odor control upgrade. So I'll. But it would be a so the, the differential size. in the pricing. The differential might eat away at what looks like a cost savings here okay. for the storage tank. Then I have a similar question. What's the difference in the cost between a storage tank with odor control and a thickener tank? What's with some level of odor control. I, I think it, you both need odor control, but right. but I think it's different different capacities. Okay. But now while you're you're talking about a storage tank, we have the two former digesters that were actually turned into storage tanks right. um, with a little revamping of the odor control system to be able to create a, a negative pressure in there instead of the positive pressure that the, uh, the diffusers do. Those each have a capacity of about 280,000 gallons. So you've got a much greater ability to store solids there than uh, um, so if you, you had a situation where you had to constantly pump it out of the thickeners, uh, you, what did we figure out? You've actually got uh, about 14, 18 days at least before you fill those two tanks up. Because we came close to that scenario when we had the gear reducer on the conveyor system fail and we had to start looking at what avenues we have for sludge storage in case we get really jammed up and we found that we can pump from our thickener building to that first digester and that would be storage there and then from there we'd have to use the pumps that are in the basement of the digester to pump it back to Hank's tank mm -hmm. and the pipes do exist. The pipes exist but you can't use it right now in sludge storage. We wouldn't want to because it's it's basically set up with aerate, aeration equipment on the bottom of it which that would once you turn that on now you're aerosoling your thickened sludge which is now odors and it's so you wouldn't want to go that way it, you would in an emergency I mean if there was some sort of a, a booster fan up with the uh, with the piping to draw more air out of there so that you create a, a negative pressure here 
and obviously that will become very viable and it would probably be more cost effective to do something like that than to be looking at building a new sludge storage tank. Because the biggest problem with that whole system was we just couldn't draw enough air out of there. On a, on a very still day with no wind, it would work. As soon as the wind came out of the west, went into that, slammed into that digester, it just went inside the vents, waked right across and right out the backsides. And that's what happened on windy days there. But at the same token, we also know that by using that as a, a, a thick a thickener or, or a, a storage tank, we're also using up some valuable real estate too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I would say that's probably the biggest drawback of that would be we don't know we don't know if uh, this nitrogen permit is going to need any sort of of that real estate. <laughs> so to commit to you know, maybe the odor control revamping isn't that, that expensive and, and you could afford to do that and then utilize that real estate down the road. But that's, that would be one concern I think about that consideration, yeah. So I think we should... Um By the way, before you... I'm sorry. Go ahead. You just introduced a concept that I hadn't been thinking about at all and that was if we need to expand the um, biological process, mm -hmm. it will likely move into the area occupied by those old digesters. Is that what is it? I mean that if you need if you need to change to a process that requires additional tankage, yeah, that that's potentially uh, it's the only place we can go, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless unless you try to configure some channels in somewhere you know far off site, you know, like I think Pam has that concept of a secondary clarifier over there, you know what I mean? And, and you just, you never want to get processing too far from each other because your hydraulics get all screwed up and you can't sure. balance it that well. So yeah, that would be the... Did, did you attempt to do a layout, a preliminary layout with the expanded biological process for nitrogen removal? Well, I tried really hard not to... <laughs> <laughs> not to require expanded. <laughs> oh, not to. I mean, you feel like it. <laughs> um, I mean, there is high. There are high rate processes now available. Mm -hmm. By the time you have to do an upgrade, there will probably be more reliable um, processes that are out there that would help um, reduce the amount of space that's required. And it's just hard to to argue, even though the the money didn't work out in this analysis for maintaining the digesters. It's hard to argue to get rid of digesters to expand aer aeration capacity. So um, so the goal of, of our analysis was, was not to necessarily use that space for the biological treatment. But it, you know, if you're not using it for anything else, it's a good idea to, to have that option. So, so we sort of didn't really put any options in that space. Just to keep. Just to keep it open. Just to keep it. Open. Yeah. Well, that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Is there room in the existing thickener building for another setup, or no? That would have to be expanded. Setup for additional thickener. No. No. That would have to be expanded. No, the center of that building has got the uh, the pumping and the permanganate feeder for our mm -hmm. control. Okay. The scum concentrators in there. So, what what's in that area, sort of to up and to the left of the lime silo? Those two white rectangles. That was an old septic receiving. The right side is an old receptor receiving, and the the left hand side that you're looking at is the Venturi flow meter that we discussed as a bottleneck for flow leaving the plant. So if you open up the oh right hand side, you'll see an old septic receiving, a pit, and then if you open up the right, you'll see, you'll look right down the pit and you'll see the adventure in here. So are there space constraints over there to put in a circular uh, third um, thickener? Might it not fit 
because the affluent pipe goes through there. You might be able to expand it towards the digesters and take up the pavement space that's out there right now. Your effluent comes in right here. And it goes across to your meter here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here's yeah. your septage yeah. receiving in here. Yeah. Uh, it has not been used as septage, septage yeah. receiving because of the, like the first three weeks we had it, it cost more to, uh, to fix than or to use it. Uh, you have a empty, you have a parking lot here with a lot of piping in, in it. Yeah. So. So even to put in a storage tank could be a challenge. Yes, it could. But that's narrower than a than a circular tank. Mm -hmm. well, the the space over there actually probably would be wide enough to do it. Mm -hmm. How big are the existing gravity thickeners? Thirties? Yeah, I think it's the same size. Are they the same size? Yeah, Thirty. <coughs> I think if you can put a storage tank in there, I think you can put a. Yeah. It could. It would Black fit. dashed line. Is that the property line? Yeah. The. Yeah, but you have the Mill River bed. I know that. Right on the back side of the buildings. I know. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about what, uh, what kinds of shenanigans you'd get involved with if you had to move the river over a little bit. Uh, so you could put the tank almost in a configuration of you've got three, and right now you have a pair in the Thickner building. You've got a pair right of yeah. tanks. Yeah. Put a third one sort of in the middle at the back side. Uh, it would go right. That would go right into your drainage ditch. Definitely. I'm sure it would. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm, again, I. But the other thing you have the to drainage ditch is uh, it's not man-made. I mean, it, well, actually, was it man-made? No, it's yeah, not. The no, that's Mill the original Mill River. River. The original Mill River, but um, it's, it's used as a drainage it, exactly now, not for water river flow. It, exactly. So it's just stormwater that comes and goes. Um, right. So it's protected. I bet it is. Right. But if if you did a project where you actually enhanced it, so it became a stormwater enhancement basin you know what I mean well, I you, you could I was thinking you could incorporate one thing an automatic bar rack for the flood control right there too <laughs> here we go well I, I don't know you know it, it just seems like there's there so the much when, <laughs> when I look at the the old mill river and what it is essentially a, a storm drain but if you if you think of it as a um, a stilling basin, a, 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 stro a stormwater uh, retention pond, a bioswale. Call it something like a bioswale. And if you enhance it, make it a larger, mm -hmm. uh, increase the capacity, and then do something, plant it with the right kinds of materials. I don't know. It just seems like that's such a. It's the only place you could expand the plan. If, and why wouldn't the two be combined? Especially if you think of it as a, um, um, it's almost a combination of, of the collection system and, and getting stormwater out of the collection system. Where do you put that stormwater? Well, you put it back in the old river. What way to make the old river better to handle that, to treat the stormwater in a natural way? I don't know. Just, it just seems like we're we're trying to squeeze all these things in here, and we're s and then in doing so, we're in, we're going to spread the processes out. You know what I mean? Without thinking about that, and, and maybe that just seems like a completely impossible way to go. But maybe if we think of it differently, it wouldn't be. If if the regulators saw it as an enhancement as opposed to mm -hmm. disrupting a natural environment. The only thing you'd have to watch out for is that the amount mm -hmm. of area that collects the water now that you didn't diminish the size of that. Well, that's what, again, that's why I'm asking about the property line. I know it's wooded, but I, I'm, and I'm looking at this page over here. I'm, I'm seeing a vacant <coughs> lot over here. I'm, I'm imagining you could, <coughs> you could double the capacity of the, of that area to store stormwater easily, I think. But I don't, I don't know much about it to know what it would take. Because you streamlined environmental assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? <laughs> 
I would say that it's it's this issue alone, citing a third gravity thickener or storage tank, is probably not enough of a driver to open up that can of worms. I, but, I, I would agree. But on, on a bigger picture, <laughs> yeah, you know, if if you are feeling really constrained generally about your site layout, and could you explore, you know, that notion for other reasons, future reasons? I mean, you could do a lot if you have more space to work with, you know. So. Well, that seems to be the whole driver with any kind of a process plant like this, where mm -hmm. you your income doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out a way to keep the plant operational all the time and, and upgrade it and replace and expand whatever it is. And how do you do that? Mm -hmm. A difficult site, you end up with the whole thing spread out all over the place. A lot of plants are like that in this part of the country. Well, <laughs> I know, I know. It's yeah, they just kind of pepper around. A long shot, Yeah. Sure. OK. I suggest we move on yeah. off of this one that I just wrote down when I'm decided. Okay. On this one, I don't, I don't know the right answer. I do think a little more information might help get us to the right answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we need to Back clarify. Yeah. We need to clarify what perceived advantages are of the storage tank and why that's being recommended. Mm -hmm. Could I, could I just say one more thing about it? And it's just yep. a little off tilt on it. Mm -hmm. But is. Could you build the th the, th the thickener building, if the little thickeners in there, could they be made higher? Instead of 12 feet deep, could we build on top of them and go up another, instead of going out or under, can we go up with them, the existing ones, and give us like four more feet or six more feet, put a whole new drive mechanism because it has to be replaced, it's going to be pulled out of there anyways. Is there any, well, anybody know anything about stuff like that? Instead of instead of just saying, okay, here's a thickener here, that's what we got to have, we got to have, let's, instead of go, let's go up, can we add on to it and add an, an, another six feet? And we want to review sort of the, I guess, the sidebar depth to, like, ra uh, radius ratio and see if that, you know, to what limit can you maybe make it square or as opposed to... Yeah, you know, I guess. Well, so you're saying wider. you're 12 feet deep now. If you go up six feet, you've got another tank between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Into yeah I may not have uh, my perfect world, but I'll have a world. Yeah. I mean, it's the right thought, though. I mean, you look at any plant that has the site constrictions that ours have, has, and a lot of times, you know, the plants start to go vertical, stack mm -hmm. clarifiers, and and these sorts of things, which are really expensive and. Um, come come in a premium, but I mean that, that I mean that's a good point. And those are the types of things you have to start looking at when you don't really have the room. Yeah. We have a lot of issues with foundation requirements of tankage, and the, the site is underlain by clay, and you probably have a lot of consolidation issues with the material under there. And old plant from the fifties is under there someplace. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you can go up. Maybe that will just ease the the existing condition and give us more time to come up with a, a, a more viable plan mm. or or look at the existing planning is the is the three days of storage at design flows is that I think it seems like that might have been a parameter that we we're trying to find a solution for is that increase the number yeah is that what you guys would like ideally is is the ability to kind of walk away for three days and have storage for that yeah yeah so then it's just no, no human being involved. It just does its thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll continue to operate with that assumption, and that's that, and that's that design flow. I mean, everything we gotta do is that design flow. So, okay. I'd also listed this issue as being one of the priorities from last week's meeting, dealing with the thickness. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay, I just didn't. Okay. That's the last I'll say that today. Maybe. Maybe ever. Maybe, maybe <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> Call me up. <laughs> Call me. We still have till Friday, John. Yeah. 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 Whoops, not back on the hook yet, is it? All right. We will revisit that and we will get back to you. Um, instrumentation and controls. Um, 
generally low cost alternatives, A2 and A3. So the first, um, the first alternative we looked at was um, centralizing um, a centralized programmable logic controller, the TLC monitoring and control. And the second one was distributed remote terminal unit monitoring and control. Um, so in the in the first one, it's all you, it's basically you have a centralized control room in in the control building, and you can monitor from there. Um, you have a single unit located there that where you can monitor and control all the processes that are hooked up to it throughout the plant. In the second option, you would have um, more of a distributed control system that you could, um, it, it, it would basically be very similar, but um, the major difference is that um, you would have RTUs being installed at the blower building and in the sludge processing building. So you have, um, you could actually go and do some process controls in those locations. And ultimately the cost for both were pretty similar. Well, they're about $100,000 difference actually. So we went with the centralized monitoring control option, um, which was about 387000 estimate. Now, can I ask one simple little question? Yes. On the uh, monitoring displays, mm -hmm. um, when you do that, can you check to make sure that if something happens, that it's readily replaceable with something fairly generic? Uh, we ran into that with the, with the uh, the flight pumps mm -hmm. where the display started to go and when it finally went we basically were running blind mm -hmm. with with that unit so we were manually adjusting the pumps and such and pretty much flying by the seat of our pants um, we ended up with a brand new unit in there because the original one was no longer being made uh, a used one found cost more than what the original was mm -hmm. um, so to have a, a piece of critical uh, instrumentation like that go blank on you and not be able to, to monitor and see what's going on, it's uh, pretty, pretty uh, heart, heart rending there. That, that, that's not right. That's not the point, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like trying to make it easier. I mean, um, I've, I've had enough uh, situations where I came in and and basically stuff isn't working and uh, put your heart in your throat trying to do, you know, trying to figure out how to get out of it and how to get around it. And, and so there has to be, you know, some, this thing about, you know, a manufacturer comes out with something and then two years later, you know, they scrap the whole design and, and, uh, and it comes out with something else and it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. You know, to replace it is is silly. You know, we need something that's going to be sustainable. Right, right. And so the so in this for this um, you know, if you have a centralized um, control area, you know, you're not going to have like you're not going to have it spread out. So you're going to save your money by having it all in one place. And as far as equipment and whatnot, you would pick, you know, you could pick the alternatives. You would do an alternative analysis of what's out there and what's available and pick the one that seems to be the most reliable. Similar to the other processes, you can talk to other people who have different systems and see what's out there. That's a good, I'm not thinking of that. So the flight situation, was that sort of like the local panel at the pump itself? Or was that yeah, the Sheridan yeah. company made that. Yeah, um, and basically we were starting to have some issues with it and it was starting to fade in and out and uh, when it finally went blank one day, you know, um, 
we were searching around for for some sort of used equipment that we could you know readily replace it yeah with, and like I said what we found was uh, was gonna cost us more than the original was because apparently the original equipment wasn't made anymore mm -hmm. um, shared it and uh, you know went through an entire analysis and figured out exactly what they could do to replace it but when they replace it they were actually gonna have to replace the display and all the PLCs that were associated with it huh. um, and then of course we had the issue that the owner died and that threw everything off and um, so it was a little bit of a like I said, kind of kind of put your heart in your throat there as you're trying to work through this stuff, and in the meantime, you're yeah. you're running your pumps the best you can, and, and hoping that you're you're not going to cause something to burn up while you're while you're because you really can't see mm -hmm. what your levels are. Mm -hmm. With the um, you know like a centralized you know SCADA network, you know that hopefully that data has some you know it, it it'll live you know and be hopefully reproducible at you know multiple workstations or yeah. multiple screens would be something that I think I mean you could get that in the distributed one too it's all about just bringing it back to the, the centralized point so I hopefully you have some some redundancy redundant. there it would be nice to That's be able to I have you know the, the the central control system yeah but then have some sort of a function <laughs> to be able to plug into that say with a laptop or something yeah yeah and on a temporary basis you know you could run it from from a laptop or, or or something till you got the replacement equipment, you know, to mm -hmm. get yourself back up and running again. But usually, the the, the human interface is, um, you know, you'd have LCD monitors and whatnot. So you you'd you could have them there. You could also um, could could you see these? Like if you were looking at aeration, you could also go to the aeration building and you would have something there. So it. So you would have like a local and more of a remote ability to, to monitor it, depending on how you guys built the system. I, I think there's yeah. uh, like infinite flexibility in what you want, you know, and I, I think what we've included is primarily just to kind of get the backbone, the backbone architecture yeah. in place. Um, but certainly that would be a much more detailed discussion down the road as to, you know, how do I, how do I safeguard this system? How do I have redundancy? Where do I want to have my... HMIs, you know that kind of stuff. But I think I think once you get it into like the network, it's just like a network in your office. You know, you can probably promote it out of computers, or you can pull it you know, into multiple terminals. Just a matter of where you want to cite those and stuff like that. Um, so I mean, I I think ultimately um, the the centralized system was recommended because a it's cheaper and it had have just as much robustness and flexibility as, as a remote one. So um, that's kind of what, that's sort of where we are on it, but we didn't really take it very far. We were just trying to get the backbone in place. Um, and I I don't know where where I think you guys feel in terms of just the SCADA in general. I mean, we don't have a, a do-nothing option, or do we have a do-nothing option? I don't think we do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think maybe we eliminated that in the past eight, or else it'd still be here. Mm -hmm. um, but that was just something that this is what you know. We talk about priorities, talk about wants versus needs. You know, I'm interested in, I guess, your feel on on where does this fall in that scale of what <laughs> of, of priority, I guess, to, for the plan. Um, I mean, I can talk about operational advantages, you know, potential, you know, fine tuning, um, you know, where a pump might lie or where you know efficiency might lie with some process. And you might get some operational savings over time by really nailing down <laughs> with instrumentation, um, but those are all. I don't, you know, I just don't know if that's something that's really a high priority or not. I'm just curious on, on feedback there. Uh, definitely, we're not opposed to SCADA because there are quite a few benefits to it. Yeah, it just we like to have a little redundancy in there so that when stuff fails, and it always does. Um, we're still able to perform the job that we're hired to do. <coughs> and, uh, so, how does your control panel function now? Do you, do you, you get you get feedback on the status of all the equipment that's running, and uh, isn't a lot it this of what, big board? A lot of what we have is what they had back in the 70s. Right, and does it still function, or 
Um, Has some of it gone into disrepair and you haven't fixed it or? A lot of it still does function and a lot of that's because it's pretty much breakers and switches. Yeah. Uh, there aren't too many displays that we have in the treatment plant yeah. because uh, you know it's older equipment. I mean the uh, the flight pumps obviously we've got the uh, display on that and that monitors you know alarm conditions and uh, and uh, which pumps are running and uh, the, the level in the uh, in the wet well there um, out in the uh, uh, floor building we've got a, uh, a simple monitor set up there that is uh, between that and uh, the sensor out in the uh, one of the tanks there it's monitoring how much air is put out into that tank and then we can create a set point and, and run those blowers and automatic. But it's all local stuff. But it's all pretty much localized stuff. We don't have anything... Uh, and hands-on. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do from a remote area in our treatment plant to make an adjustment to anything. And as we upgrade unit processes, I'm sure, I'm sure we, didn't, we provide instrumentation that's compatible with a centralized system. So the Sheridan's yeah. That system right there is good to go with a SCADA system. Yeah. We're slowly getting stuff into the plant that has that consideration, but uh, I think what we talked about last time was to get the backbone in the plant for a SCADA system and have a centralized place so we can start building off of that. Because mm -hmm. all our pumps and valves are all done by hand. It would almost seem to me that we build this into the first project. You know, enough to do the first project. The court, court of the um, maybe just with the plant as is that you'll never get a full SCADA system throughout the whole area and that in some places will have to be adjusted by hand. Every, I think Mike's making a good point, you know, every time you, you do an upgrade project now at the plant, this question will come up. That's every right. Every project. Well, and I think, and I think we should move in this direction because it's clearly state of the art and, and we should we should try to provide this capability because there are a lot of operational benefits mm -hmm. from monitoring the data and, and analyzing it and looking at trends and all of that. Um, it, it probably makes more sense. I think it can stay as an independent project here but at some point I don't think it becomes an independent project. I think it just gets worked into the first major improvements that we do, which might even be influence flow monitoring. That flow flow monitoring. On the water plant side, you guys had a positive. I mean, you've positively had use of the SCADA system there, and it's kind of a brand new, all brand new system, right? But Especially for alarms. Mm -hmm. For alarms, yeah. yeah. I think that's kind of what the emphasis was when we talked about this before was the ability to, to remotely control wasn't necessarily a, a high priority, but really knowing the alarms and, and being able to what's going on, yeah. Yeah. know what's going on and then like have a history of, of performance data and stuff like that for trending. The ability to, to control the whole process is, you know, is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not only just monitoring, but you know, at that plane every valve is automated and yeah. every every operation that we do is automated and can be fine tuned and optimized. Right. And monitored. So, you know, it's a really powerful thing when it's incorporated to that level throughout the plant. Mm -hmm. And you know, the amount of programming we have a programming contractor. We have a programmer that we have a contract with every year and we continue to to do different programming elements to the plant to, to better to, to make it safer mm -hmm. and to um, <coughs> you know improve the way that the plant is operated. So it's really powerful, and the data that you can get out of it is if you have a problem and you're trying to troubleshoot something, it's kind of mind blowing the, the information you can get. Right. So. And you save time in an emergency if you don't have to run everywhere. You can see where the problem is. Yeah. And sometimes you don't even know like you, you, there's a problem and you're not even sure, you start looking, well, what do we have for data that might help us solve this problem that we're having? And then you start to use the data and the information you have in ways that you never even anticipated. And mm -hmm. it, it's really, really great. Um, and I see those things. So when you look at this, I think sometimes it's even hard to anticipate 
the benefits because sometimes you don't realize them until you have the system in place and you start trying to troubleshoot things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving on to disinfection. Um, so currently the plant is disinfecting with um, gaseous chlorine mm -hmm. and um, in the earlier stage we identified uh, moving away from that as a disinfection source um, as a high priority. So the options we considered were um, upgrading the, um, the existing um, but convert to sodium hypochlorite and rehab the chlorine contact tanks. They're all the the chlorine contact tanks um, are to the right of the gravity thickeners there, um, and they are the, from the original primary clarifiers from the 1950s. Um, and the concrete is in some cases in poor condition. Yes, it's bad. It needs to be. Uh, Needs some tender loving care to get it back oh. up. To <laughs> it needs repair. <laughs> it needs repair. <laughs> it's not bad. And there are gates that don't move correct. They're, they're Actually, most of those gates oh, they're the gate operate gate. pretty are good. They? they all move, but they some don't seal as well. Right, okay. So that would be part of that project. Um, we also looked at converting to UV disinfection. Um, Maintaining a small sodium hypochlorite system for other chlorine, me chlorine needs, such as um, uh, I think what was one of them part of the odor control system, and then um, the other option was convert to sodium hypochlorite and disinfect in the outfall, but eliminate the chlorine contact tanks altogether. Um, I know that Amherst. Uh, uses their chlorine contact time they get credit for the pipe going from the tank out to the Connecticut River um, and then in looking at all those options um, really the converting to the sodium hypochlorite <coughs> rehabbing the chlorine contact tanks was really the um, option that we're recommending That's good due, to to, due to price and simplicity. The one problem I have with the ultraviolet disinfection is because of the fact that occasionally we do get solids in the effluent. Mm -hmm. And if bacteria is sitting behind the solids, they're not touched by the it. The UV doesn't get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a potential to actually uh, not disinfect, but of course you are. Mm -hmm. So if you went to A6, would you lose the effect of that if you were uh, using the effluent pumps? Because it wouldn't be a gravity for your contact time to be pumped out. And also what happens when yeah. you have a high flow and discharge into the Old Mill River bed and you don't have any contact time at all? Yeah, that would be a problem. So, so we don't dechlorinate at the moment. Is no, we're not required to. Is there any sense that we might have to in the future? That's a good question. Um, some, I, I know some plants do, and I just wonder why we, what's different here? What's our residual weight in the plant? Uh, we're allowed up to one milligram per liter. Uh, most of the times we're running in a range of uh, 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per liter. And we still uh, get the, the but pathogen we have, destruction. We get yeah, the we're kill. still getting the pathogen. Yeah. Uh, destruction. Yeah. The thing is, is that twice a year we do a, uh, a toxicity test where we measure uh, our effluent and the Connecticut River and they actually take different dilutions of that and to date a hundred percent of our effluent um, will not kill the organisms. So it's a low enough dosage of chlorine so it's not affecting mm -hmm. um, any organisms that might be out there in the Connecticut River and we are our flow compared to what the flow of the Connecticut River is, is such a vast amount uh, I mean we're putting four to five million gallons a day out there and the, the Connecticut River has got hundreds of millions of gallons mm -hmm. going down past there and that's a lot of the driving factor of why we don't have to dechlorinate you get down into Springfield where they're probably uh, pushing uh, uh, 200 million gallons out into the river. Mm -hmm. um, their flow is substantial compared to what the river is, so mm -hmm. they do have to dechlorinate. Mm -hmm.
and this is viewed as a high priority nuisance. That's what we discussed. It was. Okay. Um, so we have the maintenance and control building. So we looked at a number of different options. Um, one of one of the a number of the issues, there are some code issues in all of the buildings. There are um, storage issues at the plant. There's also um, there's also just general condition and um, whatnot. So looking at um, upgrading 85A, upgrade existing buildings to meet the code, reconfigure the code, the control building, expand the maintenance building. Um, to provide additional storage. Um, the second option was to upgrade the existing buildings, reconfigure the control building, but build a new um, dedicated storage building. The option number six was to upgrade the existing buildings to meet code, expand the control building for more employee space, and provide additional storage. And then the seventh option was to combine the op like a new building that would combine operations and, and maintenance building. So for the first one, you would need to, the first and second ones are pretty similar where you're upgrading the buildings to meet the code requirements um, and you're reconfiguring the control building to get for the spaces that you need. But the difference is where you're putting the storage space. So in the first option, you would expand your maintenance building, which is, by the way, the, um, the building all the way to the right, the bottom right. That's the maintenance building right there. And currently, that building, the roof, um, is in bad need of replacement. So while you're doing that, you could build onto that building and um, get your storage space that way. Um, but the, this, the other the second option, which is the one that we ultimately recommended, was to upgrade the, the buildings to meet code, fix structural problems, um, and build a new dedicated storage building. And that actually priced out um, cheaper than, or less expensive than the first option. And it also um, had the, the benefit of being able to locate it in ease of building. You could locate it in a slightly you know, further away from that building, so it, there was some ease in construction associated with building a storage building further away. Um, How much of a priority is, is this item? As far, are well... There, are there parts of it that could be pulled out that really have to be done? You could probably parse out some of these. I think storage is a fairly fairly critical need at the treatment plant. Would you guys disagree with that? Or? Yeah, it gets to be an issue. Um, basically, it seems like we're always shuffling around equipment and stuff like that. And uh, uh, Right now, we have some stuff stored in an old, uh, used to be a, uh, part of a box trailer. And uh, it's tough for people to get in and out of there and get what they need. So, you know, you don't have an easy access to get the parts. Some of the parts we deal with are, are rather uh, sizable and heavy. So a lot of times, you know, it can only be easily moved with, uh, with a fork truck or some sort of lifting mechanism. Um, and motors and, and cabling and stuff like that consume a lot of space. As you know, and you definitely don't want to just, you know, leave them out anywhere or basically say, well, I'll buy it when I need it because guaranteed you'll need it and won't be able to get it in a timely fashion. Um, How so much of the storage is used for consumables? Um, a lot of the consumables are actually down in the control building. We have an area there we call Fort Knox. Yeah, well, it used to be locked up. Stuff. Is what it was. Well, you're, you're referring to your uh, pellets. You're, you're to refer to like chemicals, permanganate yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, filters. I, you know, I, stuff that you would the, just sort of. The permanganate gets stored that we use in the uh, thickener building is stored in the thickener building. The polymers, 
and some of the permanganate that we use are being stored in the gravity belt thickener building that little square thing next to the digesters and that chemical gets used in the sludge in the sludge process building uh, we do have storage downstairs in the sludge process for like gears and, and, and materials but that's a corrosive environment so after a couple years whatever is down there needs to be cleaned up we, we actually do need a place that has a, a clean air environment mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the Taj Mahal maybe just a, a you know a sliding a garage door a couple garage doors and a couple bays dedicated space for chemicals here parts here uh, heavy stuff here and, yeah. and something else and be able to drive a forklift into it I, I was <coughs> I, I was sort of imagining what I think kind of what you're describing but I was also thinking about purchasing power so buying trailer loads versus pallet loads in other words uh, to have a you, you once you start and then and then to move pallet loads into the various locations where it actually gets used and, and run them off of uh, off of trailers no I, I was imagining a trailer load coming in you offload it on it maybe it's already palletized and you store it and and then you go through it so you're buying six months supply instead of a that's what, it, that's what I'm supply. doing now oh. I, I get I get uh, <coughs> five pallets of uh, permanganate that's good for about four 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 or five months okay and the polymer I'm good f almost like five months in advance and you try to stay ahead there yeah then the normal storage like Jim says Fort Knox that's like gloves uh, Tyvek suits yeah uh, toiletry supplies janitor janitor stuff that's loaded down there it's like falling off the walls but it's not in a, not in an organized environment mm -hmm. that stuff can stay there if it's more organized but in the places where you don't need heat a storage building that doesn't have heat you can put your polymers your permanganates your 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 uh, your big gear drives, uh, your spare parts, they don't have to be. Uh, they only have to be 40, 45 degrees to fifty degrees warm in, in a building. Mm -hmm. So when I say not the Taj Mahal, it's not okay. Let's not put a bathroom in there, an office in there, a computer in there. Just storage, storage space mm -hmm. in its raw form. Right. And there was in the condition analysis. Um, chemical storage was identified as a high need right now um, certain spaces need to be upgraded um, for electrical infrastructure um, what's the word I'm looking for Dave that um, like Div 1 or whatever the hazard environment, the hazard environment yeah. is increased yeah. because you're storing some mm -hmm. of the chemicals there so that would, if you keep the chemicals where they are there's a there's a driver for upgrading the environment um, con the environmental controls and whatnot so if you can combine your chemicals stored in one location you're going to reduce some of those needs in some of those other areas and you don't have to upgrade the spaces um, in those areas is the separate building size similarly to the expansion just out of curiosity i i would yeah is it the, the text, same amount the of storage space Okay, the expansion is 2750 square feet, and the text just doesn't talk about the dedicated building. And I wonder if we get more storage out of a dedicated building, or if it's the same thing. Yeah, we're going to have to revise. We'll have to identify square footage in there for clarity. I know it's in the uh, backup. This task also deals with upgrading the control building, also, right? some yeah. building envelope issues mm -hmm. regarding the control building is in addition to the maintenance building? Yep. Some of some of the areas in need of improvement would be um, some of the building code compliance issues, um, like ADA compliance, fire code compliance, um, emergency lighting, sprinklers, things like that. Um, and then energy efficiency items. There's lack of adequate storage in the control building as well. Um, and then the other issue with the control building is that it's not uh, laid out in an ideal fashion for for personnel and, and team considerations. So there's no like lunch room. I mean, there's a little closet where they have a the refrigerator, but. One of the challenges with this one is it's hard to get a sense for whether 
you can pr prioritize within the cost estimate. Mm -hmm. and I, I, mean, I, I understand there's a real need for this work, but this is $5 million and should we spend $5 million here or $5 million on sludge processing? And, you know, the answer is, well, we need to spend them both, but, you know, at some point, I'm not sure what we've got to do a roof or we're crazy. So yeah, right. Mm -hmm. See, yeah, that's what I was going to say. If you if you Don't drill down, skate it with our new roof. Right, <laughs> 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 toast it in a heartbeat. Yes. Yeah. I uh, so I, I don't I don't know if there's a way to prioritize within this item. And okay. I don't know. If you go down and look into the um, into the trades review of each building, um, so if you looked at the, you don't have any of this information in front of you, right? But if, if you look at so a control, hypothetically. Yeah, hypothetically, if you look at the control building upgrades and you went into the trades review and recommendations, some of them were like, so that, that's a $1.2 million number or whatever that is there. You might go in and see that some of them were immediate, like you should do this right away or you should do this short term or this, mm -hmm. you should do this in a longer term. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to go into each building recommendation here and identify things mm -hmm. that should be done, I recommend it to be done like immediately and other stuff that might be, you know, years away before you do it. Yep. Um, so there might be a way to prioritize in that way. Yep. Um, and I, I just remember that from the, from the detailed look that the trades um, people did at the buildings. That would be about the only way to do it. So I don't hear anybody saying, no, I really want a whole new building <laughs> for $24 million. For $24 million. Is it too soon to talk <laughs> about color? <laughs> color scheme? <laughs> <laughs> it's never too soon, Gary. Okay. Blue. 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 Yeah. No architects in the room. Um, <laughs> what's on sale? We're good on color. So. Maybe what we do, Pam, for this is so this <coughs> the uh, cable 9138, which is sort of the summary of these costs. Maybe we keep it as is, but then in the recommended alternative on page 185, put like a more broken down detail. If you do it by short term, long term, medium term, and or by trade or whatever makes sense to provide more, I guess a finer ability for and us to prioritize. Yeah. yeah. And that'll just help set us up, I think, for CIP. So the priors of that be with code compliance and health and safety for workers? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's sort of where the I I immediate needs fell out of path, that chapter six. Okay. It was yeah. sort of like the code code violation safety things. Mm -hmm. I think those were sort of problems with the immediate thing. So we'll have to uh, do some thinking as to how how they got split up and how, to, how those costs get associated. I don't know how fine the right. backup is. Well, I mean, I guess the issue that I'm thinking about is if you are going to upgrade, say, the control building to reuse the space differently, some of the some of those issues we identify, like HVAC and whatnot, would, would, would change depending on what you do to the space. So we'd have to think carefully about how to, how to upgrade without doing something that would have to be undone to do something else. There may be a certain amount that you just have to do. Mm -hmm. Great. So the two, um, odor control, we ready to move on to odor control? Um, one was to, um, so I guess the existing odor control facilities are um, to the right of the sludge processing building. And you go into that building and there's a pouring tank and there's um, some pumps and controls and there's um, the, that building needs to be um, upgraded for condition. It's nearing, you know, it's been around for a while and there's some wear and tear on, um, on equipment in there. So one of the options that was looked at was installing, um, you know, 
so we, whatever option we do, we need to kind of think about that includes upgrading that facility. But um, we also looked at inst installing some odor control that would address the headworks facilities. Um, so when right now there's not odor control in the headworks facility was one of the things it, that we identified as a, as a need for the headworks um, for HVAC and whatnot. Um, the other issue was um, primary clarifiers. Now these weren't identified as high issues in our condition assessment, at least not in the primary clarifier. I don't believe you guys get a lot of complaints about odors in the we're not We're not getting that many complaints about odors, but if odors are generated, it's either going on a nice hot August night or so, or late July still, or south wind coming in. Mm -hmm. I would say it's coming off the, off the, the primaries, the primaries mm -hmm. as opposed to any other place. Mm -hmm. You might get a little bit out of the sludge process, but I, I would, I would say it's the primaries. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we looked at just instead of bringing the odor control from the back end sludge area to the tank forward, uh, we looked at. Um, uh, like a new biofilter right there between the primary and secondary tank, and that would address um, odors from the headworks as well as the primary clarifiers for one of the options, or just the headworks. Um, and I believe the headworks options could be. The new biofilter would treat the headworks too. You'd have to pipe it over to it. Yeah. So in the just looking at the headworks facility, um, yeah, it would go to a new biofilter building, and so you could just deal with the headworks, or you could do headworks in primary as well. And because of the primaries being so close to the neighborhood, um, you can see the primary, you can see houses um, right across the street. It was identified as the uh, well, you know, preferred alternative, even though it would cost a little bit more to do that. Could the bio biofilter be located in the headworks? I was just going to ask mm. that. I mean, Not in the headworks, because you need the, um, I don't think there's space. Hmm? Aren't they relatively big? A biofilter, yeah. yeah. The same size as the one that's in the odor control? Um, I wouldn't think so. But I'm just an. You have a biofilter <laughs> already? Well, it's, we have an odor control where it's a tower. It's a biofilter. It's not a biofilter. Biofilter is like in a compost. You push the air through the compost. Hmm? Yeah. Like a carbon filter? No. No, compost. it's biological. Regular wood chips or something. All right. Yeah. With this. So I said, like, uh, we're talking hundreds of cubic yards of stuff, or uh, how big is it? Let's see if we I don't think it's it. hundreds of cubic yards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see anything. It says here. for the headworks only, it's 10 by 36. How deep? By <laughs> six. Uh, no, not six. Let me give it that. Well, you, how do you, how does that work? What do you, you, it's got a header and you blow the air through it and organisms grow in the wood chips and eat the stuff and it's lower cost, but you have to change it out that's what periodically. I was, that's what I was imagining is like what kind of maintenance. 10 by 36? It's green. Yeah. Or brown. <laughs> We, we, we haven't decided on colors yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's really Is there anything smaller that can be considered that you can put <coughs> up in the headworks and suck the aerosols coming over the sawtooth wear and the primary clarifiers and bring it back into the headworks where the existing unit used to be and treat both the headworks and the clarifiers as opposed to a uh, a big bin of wood chips. The bus again. Hey, I can hear it coming around the there, corner. There is a graphic for the biofilter on there. It. it looks like it's a dumpster kind of thing. Like you, what did you say? It was ten by thirty-six by something. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't. There wasn't a depth provided here, but. Well, wasn't there something that George also s spotted? This was back when we had the, the sludge holding tanks, which is actually drawing the air out of there and into the into the blowers and then injecting it into the into the aeration basin. We never want to go there again, Jim. The reason why he sucked he, our past predecessor sucked bad air out of one building and he put it into our aeration tank aeration tank system and because there was particular matter in the air that he sucked he plugged up all the orifices in our in our air in our uh, aeration tanks how'd that work out for you? a lot of labor <laughs> a lot of labor I know some of those it, it ruined it in what, about, about a month uh, but I, I'm just wondering right there in that spot a big 36 by 10 thing of wood chips or biomass or whatever you're going to call compost and we have to change it out periodically getting in and out of there yeah they're pretty low pretty low maintenance though I mean, although some would be required and it has to be inside a building it um, can't be just exposed to the environment it is exposed it is exposed to the environment it's not a building really is it just a nice little Rectangle, it looks like it's uh, just a 40 yard dumpster. But you than do that, need to get a piece of equipment like a backhoe over there to yeah, dig it out. Yeah, or something. You drive into it, maybe? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't either. It would be uh, media installed on a plenum in an FRP container. Um, yeah. I do wonder how you change it. Could you just have it inside a box? You blow air into the box, it has a couple of vents on the top, and then when you want to change it out, you pull the box and take it someplace and dump it? Well, I don't think... <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's easy, <laughs> as opposed to having to... If I have to replace the media, mm -hmm. how do you do it? Well, the same way you would install, install it, probably. Well, how would I install it? I mean, I got to come in with a backhoe or a dump truck or I'm picturing a 10 by 36. I don't know how tall it is, full of wood chips. I want to put wood chips in this vessel. How do I do it? And then, then after it's all spent, how do I get it out? Is it going to be guys with shovels? Is this in other words, John's saying we need more information. Yeah, yeah it's just, it sounds like we need more information. Actually, the, it yeah. sounds like it might be really simple if could it's in the right yards. Spot. What? Could be 80 yards. Yeah, okay, so you've got a lot of stuff. Trucks I mean, coming so you're in. not going to shovel that out yourself? No. You're talking about a wild filter? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And if it's once every six months, it's a contract thing, and maybe you don't have to do anything. Yeah, you need to design it so you can access it with equipment. Right. Yeah, I'm just I'm imagining that maybe that spot isn't ideal, but maybe it is. I, I don't. Know. It's not that big there, but I. But how do you get an excavator in there and then swing it into a dump truck and vice versa? And just material handling question. Really. And so how often? Const like constructability. If it's once a year, who cares, right? But yeah, I just need to wrap yeah, my head around it a little bit. How do you end up deal yeah, with even it? Even once a year. I mean, you, you want to make sure it's in the right spot. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be in the right spot to do what it's supposed to do in the first place, right? Duck work. Yeah, it, work. it needs to be fairly close to where. Yeah. If you're if you're running suction from the head works to the biofilter, and you're running suction suction from the primary clarifiers to the biofilter, could you locate the biofilter somewhere down on the on the uh, side driveway line there? Let's say right across from your aeration tanks, further down the road, right there. Is there room there? Well, I don't know. It's just uh, it, it, then you could suck air from both places, and and now your biofilter can be accessible. I'm just the thinking of what. Yeah. I, the, I don't know if you if you figure out the dimensions on the thing, but it's they can they can be pretty land fairly land intensive. Yeah, we had dimensions of uh, ten by thirty. 10, 10 by 50 if we were going to do both. Do both. 10 by 50. But that's, that's, you're trying to do the primary clarifiers, right? Yeah. So that would, that would be a lot of duct work if you put it over there. I can see why they would put it where they put it. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to do the control building and the primary 
clarify. When you look at two smaller biofilters, one for each facility, yeah. one for the headworks down by the railroad tracks, which is the lower part of the screen, and something else for the clarifiers. Yeah. Somebody must have looked at other technology. And was that that was cheaper, Pam, than running a suction a, a, a pipe along the fence line to the odor control to tie into the odor control down near the thickener? Yeah. Even the it would have to be a big pipe. We, or? we eliminated that. Um, it wasn't. We didn't look at it in this. Um, it wasn't one of the options we looked at in this go round in, in task nine. So we must have eliminated it in task eight. Yeah, we're on, we're dealing with A3 and A4. Right. There was a one and a two. So one of them, I'm pretty sure one of them included um, tying it into the older, the, original, the existing system now. Yeah. Which you would have to upsize in order to include these two new facilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you would have to expand the size of those. Without some sort of an additional device to suck more air well I, I don't I, the existing uh, uh, I would think you'd have a couple inline fans or something that would just run on electricity besides having a massive amount of wood chips someplace was a biofilter the recommendation for this yeah you're looking shouldn't have warmed up your coffee Jim <laughs> shouldn't have left I should have I should have read this section you know what happens is by the time you get to this one, you're like spent because yeah. <laughs> because was it going to be a bigger a bigger size pipe or because it was the whole just system would need to be upsized in order to incorporate these two facilities. The whole system would have to be up. Just uh, just follow my thought here. We're not using the digester. The two digesters are not being used. The GBT isn't being used, and they're connected to the system. And and you're telling me that sucking air from two the sucking air from the, the, the sawtooth wears on a primary clarifier is going to drive the thing to be totally upgraded. I'm yeah, you're moving a lot of air. Probably moving Across a lot, lot of the air that doesn't have a high concentration. Yeah, as opposed to what you were. Smaller amounts and much. Longer. So is it being treated effectively? Mm -hmm. Did you look at other other types of scrubbers? Or? We think they did, Jim, because they're we're looking at A3 and A4. All right. So there's some others. There's there are two that got written off somewhere along the way. Yeah. I'm not sure biofilter would be my first choice, but I just had to ask more questions about it. Well, thanks for keeping it alive while it was gone. Yeah. <laughs> we we used to have scrubbers inside the uh, an odor scrubber inside the, the in, inside the headworks, and that was just an uh, uh, water bath a, and a, a water bath chemical a, mist a chemical mist. So we and that was just localized. Mm -hmm. so Can we agree to go back and look at other technologies and move on? I can, I can go in. Disactivated carbon? That will get you to Friday. Well, you know, I, I can come back on Monday, too. Now. <laughs> oh, no, no. You know, in Pittsfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The headworks in Pittsfield. Well, it's just, like the great channel. It's just a Bible's one. I'm going to go I think it deserves more consideration. 10 by 50. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and on a yeah, site, on site that's constrained and access is difficult. I think it's going to be Centaur Media, something like that. It's yeah. just a proprietary type of brand. If you look at yeah, the site, yeah. if you come down and take a look at where it, the square is, it's very... Okay. So can we move on? Yep. I don't want to be too pushy. Um, there were no alternatives for scum and skimmings. We, re we, we recommended replacing the scum concentrator equipment with a new system. Are there any discussions about that? It's just it's just old equipment that needs to be replaced at this point. What? Replacing cones? Uh, yeah, the scum, scum and skimmings. We talked about that last week. You're down to one pump, right? In in that building for the for the scum concentrator, it's just that it's old. Yeah, that's old. You have one unit. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. One, that, one that works. Right, no, no, uh, yeah. the, uh, some, we're, in the thickener building we have only one piston pump that conveys sludge, oh. thick and sludge. We also have a scum concentrator okay. with one pump, but it's easy parts to... Replace. One one scum concentrator. No Correct, one, no one scum concentrator. Okay. Right. With the existing technology, uh, within <coughs> kind Pam, or are there scum concentrators out there that are smaller? I think it's appropriately sized. Um, you want a smaller size? Well, I, I didn't know if new technology has been almost 30 yep. something. Now we go back to what, 79? Yes. So I don't know about the proper size or anything, but I didn't know if there's new ones that could be smaller that could take the same, kind, the same amount of flow that goes in there. I think that you know what any you know what an engineer would do and you know if tasked with upgrading this you could ask them to have a more detailed look at what other alternatives okay. are out there yep. I, I don't I don't think you're gonna find a lot of space savings but um, are there operating problems with this old equipment right now no so I'll tell you with scum it's pretty well lubricated it's uh <laughs> uh, so it's a, getting a little rusty in some spots, but it, it still <laughs> seems to be a, we use it twice a week and it works pretty good. You could use a new, some new chains and some new flights refurbishing, but if we get a chance to put a new one in there, it would be uh, worth it. We're going to have it for another 30 years. Mm -hmm. So not a high, high priority, but will need to be replaced. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Electrical infrastructure. Um, the electrical infrastructure at the plant is, um, in, like the rest of the plant, is in need of replacement. Um, and right now, the, the two options that we ended up looking at were re rehabilitating and replacing the existable, existing electrical equipment. Um, in kind, so just replace the current backup generator and all the other equipment, the same, just replace it. Um, and the other one is to replace the electrical infrastructure um, with new systems that are slightly redesigned um, and that also would provide facility-wide backup. So right now, the existing generator only provides um, backup power to part of the plant, not the entire plant. And so the third option, A3 here, would include full plant backup power. Um, one of the issues, another, and so this is one of those options that we recommended that actually was more expensive than um, the other alternative. One of the reasons for, two of the reasons why we would recommend this particular option would be one, because it would provide you with backup power for, for more systems at the plant than you currently have. And the other one is ease of um, replacing. Um, with the rehabilitating and existing in kind, you're, you're kind of, the staging is gonna be a little more complicated when you're, when you're actually doing the replacement than if you were to do a new system. You could kind of keep the other one operational, build the other one, and then kind of switch over. Whereas if you try to replace everything in kind, you're gonna, it's gonna be a lot more complicated when you're doing the work. But the biggest driver is, is getting the backup power to more processing power. Yeah. Okay. Is this primarily a, a backup power option? It's primarily backup power, but also rehabilitating and replacing all of you. Electrical infrastructure. Yeah, motor control oh. centers and. Um, yeah. See, that's the part that DEP requires that we have backup power no, I, facilities. I'm okay with that. I replacing all the electrical infrastructures sounds heroic to me, so I'm not quite sure that's what we need. Well, if you're looking we at the equipment we have there now, we had a, a main breaker switch break on us, and it was a chore 
finding a replacement part and then finding somebody who actually knew what it was all about and could actually uh, repair it and install it. I'm okay. I mean, I recognize the need to fix that stuff. I, I, I just envision replacing all the underground uh, wires and all the uh, breaker MCCs and throughout the whole plant. And, and that sounds like it's a much bigger project than we're talking about. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, it's got to, there's got to be a little more definition to what we're scoping out here than just a complete plant-wide electrical system upgrade. Yeah, I call it, it's called electrical infrastructure, leading you to believe that the improvements are a lot grander and wider than they actually are. Right. I, th I think there's a, there's a much more narrow definition of what we're doing here, right. and it just doesn't come across in the text. Right. Or the text just is more very specific to where the generator is and the transfer switch and all of those things, which we're already moving ahead on to study separately, right? Mm -hmm. But we will be. And if you look at the site plan, it just talks about a new generator. But I know right now, if we have uh, power fluctuations and stuff like that, we have, you know, in recent years, lost uh, various VFDs uh, because of those power fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, a lot of that has to do with you know the condition of the existing equipment, yeah. so that if you're committed to putting in up-to-date equipment in SCADA, if you don't also make sure that you know you've got a clean source of power, uh, we could be looking at replacement costs that are going to just build on top of each other, and then the cost of this is going to seem minuscule. Mm -hmm. to, to what you'll be doing in replacement. Right. So the existing switch gear, transfer switch, generator, and main power feeders um, all need to be up upgraded or rehabilitated. So the word infrastructure means bringing power into the plant through and, and the standby generator. There it's are not the distribution of power. Well, there are also code issues throughout the plant as well. That are corrected with this budget estimate? Um, I believe so. Yeah, okay. But I will check on that. Some of them may be included in the specific project we've already talked about, too. Yeah. yeah. So we'll check on that, get more clarity there. Okay. Intermediate pumps, we sort of already talked about those. Um, with the, so there's not as much redundancy with the intermediate pumps as would be um, ideal. Um, and they're also getting older, so at some point within the planning horizon of this project, they will need to be replaced. Um, so one option would be to upgrade them um, with new submersible pumps, which is what they're currently submersible pumps. So, um, you know, upgrade them and add some additional capacity. Um, another option would be to take them out of the, the water and have axial, verti axial vertical pumps installed, again, with additional capacity. And this is all harkens back um, to the flow conversation through the plant. What would be the reason to go to the axial verticals? Ease of um, maintenance, mostly. Because um, right now, w when they're under the... So the intermediate pumps are just to the left of the aeration basin, the, on the top of the headworks there. So right under the hand. And it's actually at the pit. So the, the pumps are down in the pit, and you need to winch them up. To, mm -hmm. to work on them, and they're all, you know, have sewage on them and all that. So, 
This is where you used to have uh, screw screws. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But they haven't been a problem, have they? No, they haven't. Uh, we periodically get them pulled out. The, the train, a, a truck comes with a crane on it, and we pull, they pull them out, the, and they inspect them, yeah. fix what they have to fix, and pull them, or take them with them and put them back down. Mm -hmm. We don't pull them out for maintenance because we don't have the capacity for it or the or the uh, expertise to it. So we farm we farm that one out. Right. Sounds good. That's what we're doing. So how, how old are these these pumps? Are about twelve years old. Twelve years old. So so this is this is also a capacity issue, right? Except then, like uh, Pam said, it's in our twenty-year plan. How about the efficiency of the uh, alternate pumps, the axial? Mm -hmm. Are they more, I, I read somewhere that they're more efficient. Is that significant? I'm not a pump expert, but... Um, well, hopefully you, we'd buy high efficiency motors. Somebody thought the operating cost was a little lower. Yeah. But not. drive a decision. Um, here's the uh, there was there's also for three A um, if you're going to add capacity, you might need to um, change the, the depth of submergence. So you might have to make modifications to the to the wet well in order to fit larger pumps in there. So I think that was um, part of the consideration. So that that would have to be done with the new axial vertical pumps. Actually, I had a question about that, Dave. I forgot to ask you. I didn't understand why that was um, here. I think that's a holdover from the from the submersible pumps. You need to make those, those the wet well about. changes. We'll have to check that. So I'm gonna have to check on that. Can't imagine deepening the wet well. Yeah, you just have it's got to be heroic. Which may be why. It, 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 so I, I was. So I think if, if that's not an issue with the axial pumps, that's probably one of the drivers for going with axial vertical pumps over the submersible ones. It would make the cost look more attractive. But there's some money. Interestingly, not as much as in the submersible pump item to deepen the wet well. What do you deepen a wet well? Really? <laughs> you raise your primary clarifiers. <laughs> right at the sawtooth where? Just There's at least two projects ahead of this one, so I I'm just not, <laughs> I can't even think about this I one. just changed the data. I'm raising everything out of the ground. <laughs> I'm coming out. Yeah, this is low priority, right? Yeah. It is. Fine. Let's move on. Well, and then the last one for this is the influent flow meter, which we um, had discussed in the wet weather whether we wanted to go with um, upgrading to um, just replacing what's there in kind to upgrading the existing flow meter, um, the weir and the flow meter, or just the electronics and the existing, or installing a higher capacity influence. Um, and um, so we recommended installing higher capacity influence flume and flow meter at the existing location. And so that, that would be part of the part of the wet weather. Sure. I mean, 
that makes sense to me. Why spend money on something that doesn't do the full job? Especially if it's going to tie to a whole lot of upstream projects. If we don't have good data, how do you? Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. I don't know how you did it. Yeah. 1202. That was just incredible, Pam. Control if we hadn't time. taken all those breaks, we'd be. I would have been early. <laughs> we'd be done. Yeah, this one's up. Can't wait to talk about the flight you know system. You know I love it. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> At least I know where to get a copy. Probably a shorter conversation. Yeah, Don. Jim will have a copy down for Pam. Of what? This. Yeah. yeah. So Good job, guys. Thank you. Um, I wanted to leave you with one last thought that um, the wastewater treatment facility of the future is, you know, when you go to conferences and whatnot, professional societies, they're really talking about um, resource recovery facilities. And, you know, we're really thinking now about how, how we keep this plant operating and going forward in the future and meeting all the needs. But um, one of the reasons why the anaerobic digester was such a big part um, of the conversation and, and why the state's looking at that is because wastewater contains a lot of resources that we could that we could use um, in the future. And for one, phosphorus is something that is a depleting supply, and one way one place to get phosphorus is that wastewater treatment plants. Now, it's not necessarily something that would work here at this plant, but you know, getting phosphorus, recovering phosphorus, phosphorus or getting some heat recovered from um, the wastewater, or if you have like long drops, you know, you can use the energy from the hydraulics at the plant, so, and the anaerobic digester, so all those things are all part of the conversation that, you know, we want to be thinking about as well as we move forward, so, you know, people might start asking you guys about stuff like that as more of this gets out We'd there. be willing to give away our sludge for someone that wanted to recover stuff out of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, um, we just tried that, and it's going to cost us uh, several hundred thousand dollars a year for the to give it away. Choice, to yeah. give it away. I know. <laughs> but but we'll consider a lower we price. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, isn't part of task one of the future tasks is looking at possibilities for partnering with other communities? So it's a conversation that you can be open to, whether or not it would pan out in the end. You know. Other plants are going through, East Campton's going through a similar mm -hmm. planning process, so it's something to keep on the table anyway. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think our challenge is, um, I, I would imagine that those, those opportunities, at least initially, come at increased cost. They do. And, and, and we're struggling to figure out how to pay for what we need to fix right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that every treatment plant is having the same. I, I'm sure they are. But, uh, so I'm sure we keep our minds open to it, but there's a reality that we face that Understood. probably is a little, little um, overwhelming at the moment. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that the footprint of a Resource recovery facility might be greater than the footprint we currently have. Yeah, you're a little constrained here. <laughs> so we'll probably need to uh, figure out a date to get together again. Put the other, the other half of it, which is well, maybe not half, one third of it, <laughs> uh, the collection system. So I don't know um, if you guys want to. Jim, if you want to maybe get some suggestions to us and for us to come out next time, or or if we might have a calendar available now to think about it, certainly we should probably get together again to hit the second half of it. We could try it now if you wanted to, because all the people that would come are probably here. I don't know how people feel about that. I don't mind trying. <laughs> well, do you know his obligations are? I don't know what my obligations are. You don't? No, not really. I mean, I don't have a calendar in front of me. I Mine's on my desktop. But Handy, right? Right there where you need it. It, it is when I'm there. 
can. But I could try. We don't really care, do we? We're pretty, no. we're pretty flexible. <laughs> Not much. Not much. We can. <laughs> we can handle almost any time. Would it be next week? You think? Or? I mean, this this time worked well for me, like a Tuesday morning. Um, I think from the last time we wanted to avoid Fridays and that kind of stuff. <laughs> do you want to look at next week? Is it possible? Or? Yeah. yeah. Why don't we? Um, why don't we suggest, let's see, for next Tuesday it won't work for me. 21st? I could do Wednesday the 21st. And what's your schedule? Fairly open. Yeah. Oh, I can skip all of these things on Thursday. Yeah, the 21st and the 22nd will work for me. 21st works for me. I think the 21st probably works. That'll be a four hour meeting again. Probably I don't think it'll be four. Two. Two? Yeah, I I would probably block out three, but it might be worth to talk a little bit about you know maybe rehashing some of the priorities from the plans, and then we'll come to the collection system and maybe spend a little bit of time thinking about the next steps. You know, it might be worth a little added discussion. So yeah, let's kind of block out the twenty first. We'll just do eight a.m. again. Yeah. Okay.